Yes, thank you. We'll resume. Mr Parrish, what's happening today, uh, other than Mr May? Uh, there'll be no further witnesses today other than Mr May. OK, thank you. Um, is there anything else I need to deal with before we start? No. Yes. I should just foreshadow one of the first things I'll be doing is tendering Mr May's submission to the inquiry. I see. I, I shall... Um, establish the provenance in the usual way and tender it at that stage. Yes, I think it's already in the public domain anyway, so that seems an appropriate course. Yes. Yes, you proceed. Thank you. I call Mr Viv May as the next witness. Thank you, Mr May. Mr Parrish. <coughs> Thank you, Mr May. Could we please start with your vocational experience and how you um, came to be the interim administrator of the Windsor Caribbean Shire Council? Would you just like me to go through a little bit about what I've done and where I've been? Yeah. Yes, okay. please. Thank you. Um, look, I started my local government career at Mossman in uh, 1970 uh, and left Mossman in 2013. Um, I started, in effect, as, a, in, as you did in those days, as a junior assistant cashier rates clerk on the front counter, uh, and I worked my way through. Um, I was appointed town clerk in uh, 1986, um, and then <coughs> when they had the uh, New Local Government Act in, 2000, uh, in 1993, I had to reapply for the position and I was appointed general manager and I held that uh, role uh, until uh, 2013 when I retired. Um, I then did some consultancy work for a consultancy firm, LKS Quaro. Uh, I did quite a bit of work on Fit for the Future um, for the government in 2015. Uh, mainly um, around Canberra and down at the Nilquin and on the Murray River. Um, and I retired again. Um, and then in early 2016, um, I was asked whether I'd be interested in acting as the general manager at uh, Strathfield Council for a short time. Uh, they'd done a, the, the OLG had done a, a section 430 report on the council. Uh, and there were many issues. Uh, only, only there about a week or two. Uh, then the government asked me whether I'd be interested in going to Auburn Council as the interim administrator. And I think everyone knows about Auburn, headline a day. Um, I was there from February 16 until May 16, and then that was merged with Cumberland, uh, well, I'm sorry, with um, Parramatta and Holroyd was about 75% of uh, Auburn, 25% of Parramatta, and 95% of Holroyd. So it wasn't a simple bulk together. It was a mixture of councils. Most of them were bulk togethers. Uh, that was quite a challenge. Um, and I was there um, until September 17. Um, while I was there, I was also asked by the government whether um, I would take on George's River Council for about a month. Uh, the administrator had a commitment to go overseas, so I was doing them both uh, for a, a short time. Uh, then I retired again, um, and in June 2020, I was asked whether I'd be interested in going up to Armidale Regional Council as the interim administrator, and I was there for six months. And then um, in March last year, um, I was asked whether I would be interested in coming to Windsor Caribbean, um, and I'm still here. Um, just for full disclosure, I just like to advise your commissioner that I'm also uh, the local government remuneration tribunal. Uh, that's a statutory appointment. Um, Thank you. And um, upon being appointed interim administrator <laughs> here. I take it one of your first roles was to gather information and uh, assess what the position of the council was and what you could do going forward. Is that about right? 
Yes, look, I had an indication that I'd potentially be coming. Um, obviously, they sound people out when they get to this situation, um, and I had the opportunity of uh, doing a bit of homework uh, and um, viewing a, a couple of previous meetings. Um, and when I arrived, I had a, a, an idea, having done it before, of the kind of things I wanted to look at. I'll be taking you to some of the reports you commissioned in due course, but um, to start from the time that you physically turned up here for the first time, what was the process of information gathering that you went through? Was it uh, staff interviews, I assume? Well, look, w w when I arrived, um, I think I got appointed on the Friday and I turned up on the Monday. Yes. Um, and I'd spoken to the acting general manager and said I would like to speak to the executive staff. Um, I think it was at 10 o'clock. Uh, not in the mayor's room, but in a, you know, a councillor room if there was one available. Um, and that was all arranged and I went through some processes such as, to, I just wanted to make sure that uh, the, if there were laptops or anything like that, the councillors had, they were returned and they were secure. Um, having been through the Auburn Public Inquiry, uh, I thought that was pretty important. Um, and, you know, cars and, you know, just run of the mill things which the general acting general manager had under control but I just wanted to confirm because at the end of the day um, I was responsible um, and so there was that and then um, I indicated to the staff uh, that I knew I was coming for a, a while and that I'd done a bit of homework and this was an opportunity for them if they wanted to get anything off their chest either in that group or confidentially, now was the opportunity. Um, I didn't like being misled or getting surprises. Um, and this was an opportunity for them. Um, nothing much came out of that. Um, and then I went through the processes that I would be following, and that was basically um, some due diligence on finance, um, uh, governance um, issues, and that I wanted to establish pretty quickly because I saw through watching meetings that development was a huge issue, um, a, a panel. Um, and in effect, we started work. Um, well, they started work. Um, I then um, asked the acting general manager whether he could call an extraordinary meeting, was it the 16th or the 17th of March, um, where I just wanted to uh, indicate to the community what my role was, that I wasn't the general manager, uh, because of the, it was, in, the, in my view there was a lot of confusion in this place about general manager, executive staff, mayor and councillor, and I want to make that very clear to the community. Also, um, unbeknown uh, to the executive staff, it was my intention to replace the acting general manager immediately. Um, and. Um, Behind the scenes, I had been talking to a couple of people uh, and I settled on Mr McMahon um, because he was from, in effect, the Highlands and, and knew the area. Um, so that's what happened. Um, we then had the meeting on the 16th or the 17th. Um, the staff had no idea that I was intending to remove the general manager. Uh, but as is my uh, modus of operation, I paid respect to everybody. I advised the acting general manager about an hour before the meeting uh, that he would be replaced. Was that Mr Burgess yes. at that time? Yes. And he'd been in that role for a relatively about short amount of time, was it? Yeah, about a week, I think. Yes. And after that, Mr Les McMahon came on board. Yeah, Mr McMahon came on the Monday. Um, to understand it that at or about this time you also had interviews with the suspended councillors? Yes, um, I spoke to the Mayor first and I spoke to all of the suspended councillors and the two recently resigned ones 
Um, I didn't speak to the councillor who'd resigned due to ill health. Uh, I had intentions of it, it um, well, we quite frankly never got around to it. Um, and I was told he wasn't well, so um, I kind of moved on. Um, look, when I arrived at this place, um, I was overwhelmed. It was like you know, drinking from a fire hydrant. Everyone wanted to talk to me. There were just so many issues. Um, but I wanted to pay respect to the mayor and the suspended councillors um, of getting, in effect, their side of the story. Uh, and I think some people were a little bit frustrated um, that I wasn't speaking to some residents straight away because there were some outstanding issues that needed to be addressed. But I wanted to send a clear message to the council staff and the community that I had been put here for a reason and I wasn't going to waste time. C can I preface my next question by saying if there was any understanding of confidentiality or explicit assurances of confidentiality, let me know. But um, can you tell me about your impressions or any um, specific um, matters which came out of your interviews with the councillors and the mayor? Yes. Um, I obviously watched the final two meetings um, and this was a council in crisis. Um, after, and that wasn't only at the governing body level, I believe it was at the administrative level as well, particularly the um, executive staff. Um, I then, after having spoken to the councillors, uh, there, to me there didn't seem to be any acceptance on the part of the majority that they were part of the problem. Um, and I found that difficult. Um, and at the end of the day, I came to the conclusion the place is a debacle. Um, there was no formal structure. Um, the, from talking to councillors, it appeared to me that some councillors were getting more information than, than others from the executive staff. Um, I could not believe the amount of briefings and workshops that were being held. Um, and some councillors were uh, raising concerns about leaking of information and confidentiality and that type of stuff. Um, and you know, I, I, I was concerned about those matters. But at the same time, um, and I'm not a lawyer, but I have some difficulty with understanding how through a workshop or a, um, a briefing, if you release stuff, how do you keep it confidential? I know it was in the, I think the council's code of meeting practice was amended, uh, but it wasn't a mandatory condition. Um, and, you know, I, I used to think to myself in the early days, well, you know, don't wish to me, it serves you right. Um, you're not doing this properly. There's just too much secret stuff going on here. Um, and, it's, and, and I think to the community, the council was a mystery. Can I go back a step? Um, you referred to the uh, insight or acceptance of the majority as to how their behaviour might have been affecting. Who do you mean by the majority? What, how, how do you define or, or demarcate majority from the majority, minority? Well, well the, the, the group that appeared to support the mayor, and you know, the, the mayor actually said to me that, and um, uh, Councillor McLaughlin uh, said to me, that I should be recommending that the council return. Um, uh, Councillor Turland had resigned, he was the problem. And I remember I said to the mayor, uh, have you watched any of the YouTube of your chairing of meetings? Um, I think he took offence at that, but uh, that was the reality of my conclusions. Can I just pause there? There's something which um, I had some discourse with um, the commissioner on in the opening about whether the uh, minister has any power to dismiss or suspend individual councillors. Are you aware of any powers that exist? For I don't the believe there are any. I think it's 
one gone or gone, suspended. Uh, that's my understanding, but I'm not a, a lawyer. Was it suggested to you in those discussions with the councillors that the minister should have taken that sort of action against particular councillors rather than the whole of the body? Oh, yes, yes, met, met by a number of the councillors. Yes. And I told them, you know, that's really a matter they should take up with the minister's office, uh, that uh, I'd been appointed as the interim administrator, but I could not see how that could, ha could occur. While we're on this topic, and it may be, I may be jumping ahead, um, but it's been suggested to me in a number of ways that this was a problem caused by two, perhaps three councillors. What do you say to that view? I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, that... Look, the, the minister, when she suspended, and I talk about Minister Hancock. Yes, I understand. Uh, the, the minister, when she suspended the councillor, yeah, the councillors, um, in my view, she had no option other than to suspend them all. And my observations of meetings and having spoken to councillors um, and having read the performance improvement order, um, they'd had a chance uh, to improve. And I, I could never understand why uh, some of the councillors were, in effect, attacking OLG and the minister when the minister had given them a chance to improve and considerable amounts of money had been spent um, on trying to get the council to improve. But having been here, say, a month, I then begin to realise that the blame for what the debacle that I thought the council was just didn't totally rest with the councillors. Yes. Um, I'll let Mr Parrish explore those issues mm -hmm. with you. Thank you. You referred there to uh, the concept of some blame line with the OLG or the minister. Was that a theme which came out of the interviews you had with the councillors at that stage? Yes, particularly the mayor. Uh, was there a view held by the mayor or any of the other councillors that there was an element of a political stitch-up in the suspension of the council? That wasn't raised uh, with me. Um, the, some of the councillors did raise um, what they considered to be interference by local members. Um, and I think I indicated to those councillors that those members are listening to the community they represent and in any event, local government is a creation of the state. The local members are doing their job. Um, but the minister is the one who has suspended uh, the council, not, not the local members. In, in your view, did that also betray a lack of insight into how the behaviour in those meetings that you viewed came across both to the community and perhaps to any reasonable person watching the behaviour in those meetings? Oh, definitely. You know, this was a very, very bad example of good local government. Can I pick up on the topic that you raised about the use of confidential information or confidentiality in briefings? Can you just expand a bit on that and give me some examples of um, what you saw as inappropriate or just bad process in that regard? Oh, look, uh, the, the, the release of confidential information, um, I don't have any specifics in, in relation to that uh, because that hasn't been my arena. Um, I was just interested in the whinging of councillors that you know some councillors are allegedly leaking um, this information, and, and particularly in relation to... Um, uh, Station Street. Um, Station Street, you know, eh, no wonder the community, um, and 
And, and, and another thing I was being told, it was only a handful of people who, who were causing all this disruption. Uh, to, well, that's just clearly wrong. Hundreds of people, when I went on my little journeys out into the villages, wanted to see me, and everybody had a story about the council. Um, and I think the first meeting I had had over a 1,000 YouTube views. If that's a handful of people, um, you know, I think... Um, they're, they're wrong uh, and you know still today um, and this has never happened where I've been ever before including Mossman um, you know I'll be out in a, a in a shopping centre or something like that people come up to me and say thank you um, it's um, the, the place was a debacle um, and the, the community had had enough do I understand that you also met with state and federal members at around this time? Yes. Uh, again, prefacing my question um, with any confidential information or, or, or assurances of confidentiality, are you able to tell us about uh, your dialogue with those state and federal members and what yes, their yes, impressions were? Yes. Um, the state members. Um, I, I reside in Sydney and it was, it was, Parliament was sitting, it was easy for me just to go into Parliament House. Uh, I met with um, uh, Tuckerman and Smith in Parliament House for about half an hour um, and they expressed to me their disappointment uh, in the Council um, and we didn't really discuss any specifics. Um, they uh, indicated to me, you know, look, can you just try and get public confidence back in, into the council? Um, I met with uh, Mr Jones, uh, down, member for Whitlam, uh, down in Shell Harbour. Um, both, both federal members had really, um, I wouldn't say lost interest is the right word, but it had enough uh, of the council. Um, and, uh, you know, I, Mr Taylor uh, actually said to me, you know, can you try and work out what's happened with the Berrima bypass because I can't and no one can tell me. Um, and, you know, I looked at that um, and it's just another problem. But, but we, we did, in, in our discussions we didn't discuss anything specific. It was just generally, you know, can you please restore... Well, really I think that, that the, the view was for the four of them you know, thank goodness the Minister's taken a stand. Uh, can you just get on with it and try and restore public confidence because the Council's failures are affecting the community um, and, more importantly, the community's ability to get grants through state because the state is losing confidence in them too, their inability to, to deliver. Do I take it that the observations from those members, both state and federal, <laughs> was an opportunity for them to reflect to you the views of their electorates? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And, and look, um, I, there was a press release issued the other day, um, uh, I don't know whether you've seen it, um, by five of the councillors, um, and you know, they, 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 that press release criticises the, um, in effect, the, the minister, OLG, uh, members and myself, all we're guilty of is listening, which they weren't. Thank you. I'm just working off for now your, I think, first report to Minister Hancock on 10 May 2021. Mm -hmm. should, should Mr May have that? That would be helpful. If, yes. Um, exhibit B. Mr May could have Exhibit B. Uh, page 239.
Mr. Parrish, do you need mine? I've, um, I've got a version. You've got a version? Thank you. All right. Something's gone wrong in the witness copies. Yeah, tough. Hopefully you've got the 10 May 2021 uh, report in front of you. Yes, yes. In a slightly shrunken form. Um, you refer in this report to commissioning a number of um, reports, which I, I don't think you had any of those in by this point in time. Um, by this point in time, however, you had already formed the view that there was much to be done to restore the community's confidence in the council and that the elected body and former executive of the council had shown a complete disregard for the community they were elected and employed to serve. Bearing in mind you hadn't obtained the reports... I'm sorry, Mr day. Parrish, I think um, you may be at cross purposes if you go to the paragraph above where you're reading. I think Mr May might have had Pardon me. one or two. You, I, I think that's right. Pardon me. I, th I think you'd received one or two of the reports, um, but a bunch came in in June from memory. Um, what had led you to that conclusion at this stage around 10 May 2021 of the lack of community confidence, the complete disregard for the community? The initial reports <clears throat> that I um, uh, commissioned um, were really due diligence matters uh, relating to finance um, because finance is an issue and um, up at Armadale, um, it was a massive issue. I don't think it's an issue here, uh, even though I do think um, which through the um, ARIC, uh, the general manager and the staff are sorting a, a number of issues out of how they, uh, in effect, play with what they used to, play with reserves. Um, so, and the governance one um, was... Um, a due diligence, so that just showed what, what, what hadn't happened, but basically at the end of the day they weren't too bad, those reports. Uh, what drew me to my conclusion was talking to residents. Um, and, you know, I, I well remember um, the first formal meeting of the council I had, I uh, had to deal with the question of the Bowral Memorial Hall. Um, and a lady came uh, and addressed council and I, th I thought to myself, you seem very sensible, um, I'll meet with you. Um, and by that stage, I think there was a lot more confidence building at, lower, at the level three of the, of the council uh, that I could be trusted um, and that I had a rough idea what I was doing. Um, and a couple of members of staff came to see me and said, look, um, these are my words, not theirs. The council's just being bloody-minded in this. Um, we have a solution. Um, and I met with the, uh, some users of that facility. I met with the staff. I made no promises to, to the residents because I wanted to talk to the staff again. Um, and it was sorted out in one meeting. It had gone on in the council for ages because it seemed to me they had an attitude, we can, so we will. Um, and that's no way to treat ratepayers. Uh, you then um, move uh, on to DA matters, which I just found overwhelming. Um, and I'm no planner, um, and I'd already moved to put in a, a panel, but some of what I was being told, um, they're operational matters, so you know I, I got out as quick as I could. And I engaged um, with um, Mr McMahon, um, Malcolm Ryan. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, he saw about 67 people um, who, you know, I made it very clear in the minute I brought down that we weren't going to reopen merit issues, that, that we were just looking at issues. Uh, and, you know, I've... Uh, form some very firm opinions about land use planning in this shire uh, as a result of that. Um, but 
to a answer the question, I, through talking to residents and listening, um, it wasn't too hard to pick up that uh, the council was just digging a hole for itself. Um, were you getting any feedback at this time specifically about conduct and meetings either between councillors or in the way that councillors interacted with members of the public, either at council meetings or at things like the bushfire uh, uh -huh. community meetings, which we, we've had some evidence on that already, or other committee meetings? Mm, look, uh, it, when, when it comes to council meetings, um, I wouldn't say I shut down discussion with residents, but I'd seen the meetings too. Um, so, in effect, um, I just acknowledged the fact that it just wasn't acceptable behaviour from the governing body, and, and we moved on. Um, when it comes to the bushfires, well, that's just another chapter. We might come to that soon. Um, but, but for now, at least my question, and perhaps you've answered it, is you were getting feedback from the community about the behaviours of councillors oh, yes. in and, meetings. And not from a handful of people. Um, can I just ask about the decision of the implementation of the local planning panel? Sorry, before you do, Mr Pardon? Parrish, um, before you move on, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Mr May, do you still have page 239 in front of you? Yes. Things I, missed I think Mr Parrish is moving on. There was just one issue I wanted to explore with you. In the last paragraph on that page, you say, uh, third line, a lack of respect, transparency and communication has led to constant suspicion of decision-making processes. Do you see that? Yes. What, what led you to express that view? I took the view there was no respect. Um, councillors with each other, uh, councillors with executive staff, uh, councillors where they shouldn't have been, with operational staff. Um, and I, the, 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 the operational staff had built walls uh, because um, there, there was no leadership uh, from the general manager and the acting general manager, in my view, uh, to protect the staff. Um, the the, the councillors, um, it, it, and I don't think it's just ha this lack of respect has just happened um, in the last council. I think it's been going on here for a long time from the feedback I get. Um, but it just was taken to a new height. Um, and you know the, the lack of respect became adversarial in a way, um, and um, I've heard you know people talk about point scoring, um, you know, and, and gotcha moments. Uh, you know that doesn't help the council deliver its services. As part of that answer, do you? Um, I think I understood you to be talking about councillors crossing into the operational divide. Is that what you have in mind? Oh, yes, yes. And had you received reports of that sort of thing happening? Um, I, early on, and I did this in a... Look, um, I understand the difference between operational and uh, the governing body. Um, and I think a lot of people used to think I was very black and white in those areas, particularly at Mossman. Uh, but I didn't allow councillors to cross the line. Um, and here, um, there was a blurring, and I think that was facilitated by the general manager, because the general manager didn't stop it. And, you know, you, you have the example of a mayor wanting uh, to tell staff, uh, and the unions raised this with me, because I met with them, and how to fill potholes. And it's allowed by the general manager. Um, you know, that's just, it's not on. Um, and staff, uh, in, in that minute, um, I did indicate that if staff wanted to come and talk to me, uh, they could. Um, after about three or four came, I thought to myself, um, you don't want to get too wrapped up in this. Um, refer them to the general manager. Um, and I did. Um, but I did speak to some, a couple of former staff uh, who I put in, into the general manager too because also what was happening um, is when staff were leaving, they were getting forced to sign um, confidentiality agreements. Um, and I, th I don't know how many there were, maybe two. 
uh, people came to see me about that, but I got out of it and left it uh, to Mr McMahon. But I did say to Mr McMahon, um, I would suggest you release them from their confidentiality agreements, and if it needs a council resolution, you'll have no problem from me. It might be the only way you get to the truth. These were staff who left for all sorts of reasons? All sorts of reasons. Mm. Is that something that you'd seen in other councils in your experience? Um, Outside of perhaps contentious departures, if I can put it that way? I hadn't seen that at this level, no. Yes. And I must say that the people who left uh, since uh, I've been here and Liz has been here, no one's been asked to sign a confidentiality agreement. Thank you. Um, why is the, in your view, the divide between councillors and governance and strategic and the operational side of the organisation an important one to have maintained? Mm. Well, look, I, I, I deal with this in the final report to the Minister uh, and in my submission uh, to you, Commissioner. Um, I, I, I don't think that councillors, as a governing body, understand just how powerful they are if they use their positions properly um, and get into strategic areas. Um, this council, it appears to me, lost its, and this is particularly in land use planning, uh, which is bread and butter for a councillor. Um, they, they lost their focus on the big picture, uh, more interested in the smaller individual DA. Well, there's, in my view, there's no role uh, for a councillor in that arena. Um, the, what the councillor's got to do, they've got to put in place their vision uh, for the future of, of the community they represent um, and then leave it to the professionals to get on with it. Now, if the professionals don't adhere to the council's policies and procedures, well, you, you hold the general manager accountable for that. Uh, but you can't be sending mixed messages. And, you know, I... I when, when I um, suggested a panel, or I said I was going to introduce a panel at my first meeting, I had a bit of a lukewarm reception to that from some staff. I th just had the feeling, uh, I have no proof, but I just had the feeling that they thought they're going to lose some control um, in, in, in that arena. Um, and the reality is they lost total control. Um, Do I take it from that answer that councillors getting, um, spending time in council meetings on individual DAs with specific features um, you don't see as a good use of civic time? Not at all. Mm. Um, and, you know, in, and I think it'd be uh, more appropriate. Now, I don't have the final report of um, um, Earth Consulting because um, um, that was considered to be an operational matter and it's confidential. Uh, but the residents who I referred off to uh, Mr Ryan, quite a few of them raised with me political interference um, in, in the processes. And that's that suspicion of decision making you were referring to in your report to the Minister? Yes. It? Yes. And um, what about consistency in decision making on individual DAs? Does well, that was that, that that was part of the concern by residents here. I see. That some people got it, other people didn't. Um, and you know, as I say, I exited from that space. I understand because I had enough inf enough on my plate already. Yes. Um, and before I hand back to Mr. Parrish, still on page two thirty nine, if you have that in front of you, after that passage that I've just drawn to your attention, you go on to say. There is much evidence that the council had simply stopped listening. What, what did you mean by the council had simply stopped listening? Were there any particular oh, I, examples that come to mind? Well, in, in relation to the uh, land use planning space, I'm, I'm not sure, but I have some views uh, on that. But my examples for stop listening, Station Street, um, Mittagong Playhouse, um, Bowral 
um, Memorial Hall. Um, the use by the community of council-owned facilities, uh, generally. Um, there, you know, there, there are some examples, and um, you know, e even the Welby Tip issue, which you probably haven't even heard of, uh, it's a massive issue uh, down there. But the council just seems to have said it's too hard. Uh, since I've been here, there's been a report come to council because uh, I've asked for it because the community asked me, the residents down there, um, and it's just that the the, 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 the in, in my view, the council wasn't undertaking one of its primary roles as, 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 as councillor to represent the community. Uh, they're representing individuals rather than the community. Yes, thank you. Mr Parrish? Can I just turn you over the page? And <coughs> that starts the Windsor Carabee Shire community has lost trust in their elected representatives and a lack of leadership in the governing body and executive staff has severely impacted on the health and safety of many staff. I think we've covered your impressions and how you came to them in respect of the loss of trust and lack of leadership. But can we just turn to the impact on staff? Um, council um, has an obligation to be a... Um, responsible employer and provide a consultative and supportive working environment for staff. Can you tell me about how the governing body interacts with that obligation? Is it the governing body's job to direct and control how the general manager controls his or her staff? Or should they, ought they be more proactive in ensuring the health and safety of... Well, well the only person the governing body employs at the end of the day is the general manager. Um, and I believe at the end of the day it's the general manager's responsibility to look after the welfare uh, of, of the staff. Um, but from recollection, um, and I've never looked further into this, but from recollection, the mayor in the second interview I had with him, because he asked me, I've met with him three times, um, indicated to me that the former general manager had a claim in against the council. Um, now, I've, I've never looked further at that because I was trying to go forward. I was a bit sick of going back all the time. Uh, I think I'd, in my own mind, I'd proved what I wanted to, to prove to myself to try and take the place forward. Uh, so uh, there's, there's a clear responsibility, um, but but in, in saying that, um, the general manager has to be firm with councillors. You know, if you if you're all things to all people, uh, it'll turn to custard. Um, you've just got to be firm, but you've got to what one gets, all get. Um, and if you allow one person to you know overstep the mark, how can you stop the rest of them? What about um, the impact of council behaviour, whether in meetings or in, in, in interacting with staff? Can that have an effect on whether the workplace is um, consultative and supportive? Well, in my view, the staff here were badly let down by the executive staff for, in a way, facilitating some of the behaviour. Yes. I appreciate that, but does, do you think that the councillors themselves have their own personal obligations in how they behave? In oh, most definitely. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's very clear. Yes. Um, so and councillors appreciating the, the important role that the general manager has to play, do the councillors themselves nevertheless have their own obligation not to transgress their role into the operational space? Do you agree yeah. with that? Yeah. Yes, yes Mr Parrish. Did you have any specific examples at the time of writing this report of impacts on staff in health and safety respect about caused by lack of leadership of the governing body and executive staff? I am of the opinion 
that by virtue of what was happening at the top, the culture just filtered through. I had staff come and, uh, come and speak to me, not many, but when I kind of opened the door to start with, um, uh, about being embarrassed to work for the council. Um, and there was one lady who spoke to me about a pop-up uh, that the council had somewhere in Bower about an environmental issue one Saturday morning and a councillor turned up um, and took over. Um, you know, I, um, I said to her, well, at Mossman, uh, the instruction would have been if a councillor turns up, respectfully ask them to go. If they don't, just pack up and go yourself. Uh, the councillor's the one who will be embarrassed at the end of the day. Uh, I must say it, it didn't happen at Mossman uh, because we had clear rules and guidelines. That, that, that doesn't mean it was easy uh, because you'll always get councillors who want to push the uh, push the limits. Can you um, do you recall who that councillor was and broadly when it was that event? No, and the person concerned didn't tell me the councillor because I said I wasn't interested. Um, but look, I, I, since I've been here, I have been in overdrive to make sure I talk about the elected body or the governing body, not individuals, um, and the executive staff, uh, not individuals. You've touched a few times now on the appropriate and effective communication between councillors and the executive level of staff. Can I ask you a two-part question? Firstly, what, in your experience, the most effective way of having a policy on that is, and secondly, whether such a policy or, or guideline existed in this council when you um, became the interim administrator? Well, it existed, but whether it was enforced, uh, you, you've got to have it uh, under the, uh, the Code of Conduct. Um, but look, it's, it's about respect, it's about consistency, um, and at the end of the day, if you treat everybody the same, whether it be an elected member or a, a councillor, now they'll all respect you. Um, and they mightn't like you, but that's not what you're here for. Um, you know, I just... Um, it, it, it wasn't consistent. Can you explain to the inquiry what the proper um, chain of command or siloing of the communications that councillors should be having with staff is? Is it a matter of councillors ought to talk to certain members of the senior executive and then the senior executive interacts with individual staff members or is it appropriate that councillors talk directly to staff members? No, uh, no, no, no. Uh, the, 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 the process is that the general manager, uh, in effect, issues instructions about who councillors can talk to. Uh, it's my understanding here that it was to... to level three group managers, but I had a bit of difficulty understanding the organisation structure here. Um, and I generally only spoke to the acting general managers and now the general manager. Um, but from what my position, I'm now talking to the directors here uh, until the organisation structure is sorted out um, and I do my best to try and stay away because I, I say to residents, look, they're operational matters. And it's amazing, if you explain to a resident why, they accept it, you know. It, it, it's, I suppose I'm not chasing a vote. Um, yes, yeah, so that highlights a question I had, which I may as well ask now, was that the obligation of a councillor is not well, tell me if you agree with this. <laughs> is it the obligation of a councillor to take up any and every issue that a resident may raise, or does the councillor have an obligation in accordance with the, their duties under the Act to exercise discretion in accordance with their role? Well, well, the latter. The, the councillor has to. But look, in, in a, the other hat I wear as the remuneration tribunal, um, you know, the submissions to sittings of the tribunal um, a lot relate to the, the full-time role of the councillor. A councillor role is not a full-time role. Um, and, you know, I try to explain to people that 
um, used properly, it's a very powerful role. If you use the community strategic planning processes, um, you can leave your stamp on a community, uh, on a shire. Uh, but if you just want to become involved in you know, grass cutting, um, you'll come and go. Yes, thank you. Um, do you have any other ex specific examples that at least this stage you are left with in respect of how staff were being impacted by the lack of leadership and a loss of trust in the governing body? Well, specifically, um, the in matters I became involved in, um, the um, Station Street, uh, which was a huge issue, uh, the fires, yep. um, another huge issue, um, and smaller but just as, as relevant, really, Mittagong Pool. Uh, for instance, you know, I've taken the time uh, to read the flood reports, uh, the, the flood studies on the pool, um, and I don't think the councils uh, followed the recommendations or the suggestions in those studies in relation to improving that pool. I've kind of, it's, that's out for public consultation at the moment, but, you know, I've asked through the general manager whether that could be addressed. They're just those types of things that, uh, to me, you know, the staff know, but the staff have been squashed. Um, and I think, um, to a high degree, uh, as a result of the executive staff wanting to appease councillors. And can I just end on the topic of health and safety of staff, at least your impressions as at 10 May 2021? You describe it as a toxic culture, about second paragraph from the end. Um, can you elaborate on what you meant by toxic culture and how you came to that impression, subject to the fact you've discussed it um, in some length already? I think in relation to um, individuals, that's probably a question better addressed to the general manager. Um, but in, I am aware uh, that the council's um, uh, workers' compensation premiums um, have gone up considerably uh, by virtue of claims um, uh, that aren't um, what you'd call normal run-of-the-mill claims. Um, additionally, um, you know, the the, the, the council staff thought that they, that their professionalism was not being respected, uh, and that builds, you know, a, a, a culture. I'm not saying in every, every part of the council, uh, because to be quite frank, I've only ever been behind into the workplace once uh, since I've been here, because it's just not my role. Um, and the culture here had to change, and someone had to initiate that change through leadership, and that's what I've been trying to do. Um, you, sometimes you get criticised uh, for not taking an interest, but I am very interested, uh, but knowing the constraints on the role. Um, Commissioner, I'm going to turn to the next report, dated 10 August 2021, unless you have any further questions about that first report. Uh, yeah, just, just one. Um, if you have page 240, Yes, and about halfway, a little above halfway up the page, there's a paragraph starting suspended councillors. Do you have that? Yes. The second sentence, clearly their behaviour has been dysfunctional and coalitions of convenience have been formed and together with the former executive, we're an embarrassment to and poor example of good local government. What did you mean by coalitions of convenience? Um. <laughs> Uh, councillors will play games to get numbers for specific issues, and that's what happens. And, you know, I am the, 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 probably the worst example I can say of this is in relation to the housing strategy. Um, I thought it was very, very professionally done. 
Um, I took the time to go out with officers and look at what they were proposing. Um, but apparently when it got into the political arena, uh, there were deals or coalitions of convenience uh, to take areas out, put areas in. Uh, that's a high level. But you know, coalitions of convenience do happen uh, in councils. Um, but let's be open and honest about it and transparent. Yeah. You know, I, I think to, to a degree, the, the numbers apparently on um, Station Street changed um, as, you know, became hot in the kitchen, like you, you could put. But, you know, there, there were coalitions. There's, there's always coalitions, um, but um, you, you know, people trade votes for mayoralty, for deputy mayor. Um, that's just a reality of democracy. Uh, but the coalitions of convenience here, I think, took it to another level. By that, do you mean that the coalitions of convenience were more political and less about the role of a councillor in the governing body as described in the Act? Is that what to you mean? Totally political. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I might just take you to that first sentence before we switch to the next report. So as at 10 May 2021, you'd form the view that the suspended councillors, in your view, did not warrant return to council office. And should they so de desire, they can present for re-election. Um, turning to the next report, 10 August 2021, had your view changed by that stage at a high level? We'll go into the uh, details uh, of the report. Uh, can you just repeat that, sorry? I was trying to find the place. But... Uh, yeah, 10 August 2021. I might be able to provide you with a bigger copy now. We've found the problem. Um, and if you go over to page 262. 262. Oh, I see. Yeah, flows. Yeah. Yep. Is that the 10 August 2021 report? Angus. Yes. I might steal that little version off you because I've marked it up, Mr May. Thanks. Yes. I guess I'll just start with an introductory question. Um, these reports been three months apart. Had your view changed by 10 August 2021 as to whether the councillors warranted a return to council office? Oh, de definitely. And that was influenced to a high degree by the arrival of the general manager, uh, the new general manager, um, when she began to alert me of some of the issues under the surface, which I hadn't, uh, weren't known to me. Um, and in fairness, they wouldn't have been known to Mr. McMahon. He had his hands full dealing with the day-to-day -day operations. Um, but at, at that stage, um, we had a, a stronger group in the council. Um, extra people had been brought in um, and able to look further under the surface. So yes, I, and I admitted uh, in a minute that I'd changed my views um, on a return of the council. Um, Sorry, so what, is the, what was your view as at 10 August 2021 about that issue? I'm just not sure I follow the, the, the sequence. I, I, I was at the, at the view that in effect, there should be a public inquiry yes. uh, into the council. And I, I formed that view uh, based on uh, the advice that um, the general manager was giving me um, and um, her concerns um, and the fact that uh, the mayor um, had gone on radio to say that he'd probably be unwinding 
some of what you know we tried to achieve. And you know, I thought to myself, there's no lessons that have been learnt here. Yeah. So the change in view, just so I understand, was in in the in the 10 May report. You'd said suspended councillors, in my view, do not warrant a return, and should they so desire, can present for re-election in September 2021. Mm -hmm. And by August, you'd formed the view that it was an appropriate matter for an inquiry, which would. Well, thought, the elections were delayed anyway, but is that the idea? Yes, I thought an inquiry was the only way to the truth. Yes, thank you. And perhaps more for the benefit of the public than me or the Commissioner at this stage, uh, your view had become more negative about both the conduct of the councillors, the acquittal of their roles and the general state of the council when the suspension had taken place. Is that fair? Yes, correct. Um, turning to the 10 August 2021 report, it's something, something you briefly touched on before, but second from the bottom paragraph on the first page, You mentioned that the meeting of council that was called to consider your notice, which was the notice of um, proposed suspension, yes, I think, yes. can at best be described as a debacle resulting in the council being placed in independent administration on 10 March 2021 for three months. Um, you briefly touched on it, but can you tell us what led you to the view that that meeting was a debacle? The behaviour of the councillors and, in my view, the lack of respect to the community they were elected to serve. Um, I, um, I've, I'm even stronger in that view now that uh, I've seen some of the exhibits you've put out. The, the letter that uh, councillor letters that councillor Whipper and councillor Nelson um, have written um, yeah I, the the are you referring to the exchanges um, about station street no 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 commissioner those are at page two three one of tender bundle B and oh, two think. three three. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm at cross purposes. I understand. Thank you. You, you, you kind of addressed it in your... Uh, you didn't say that in, in the opening comments, and I thought, I want to go back and read the opening comments. Um, and the, uh, the, 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 the council assisting comments, and then I came upon these two letters, which, you know, I just thought, the, the lesson hasn't been learnt and you've been through a performance improvement order, you've had the benefit of experts, and there's just still no recognition. Um, Mr Parrish, perhaps just for my benefit, when I'm reading the transcript, if you would show Mr May the two letters that we think he's referring to. Yes. Uh, Sorry to take I, you off course. No, no, um, it's probably an appropriate time to deal with these letters at a broad level anyway. Uh, you... I think have the correct tender bundle in front of you already. <coughs> Can you turn to 231? 231. 231, I think, of your bundle. Yeah, it's... Um is that the letter yes. that you're referring to from yes. Councillor Peter Nelson, dated 8 March 2021, to Minister Hancock? Yes. And next document along is at page 233. It seems to be a perhaps pro forma customer service web form uh, generated by 
uh, Councillor Whipper. Is that? Yeah, no, but if you get if you get a two three four, you yes. will find the Whipper letter. Those are the documents you're referring. They're, to. they're the documents I'm referring to, and and they reading them on the weekend um, gave me confidence is the wrong word, uh, but I thought to myself, you know, I am on the right track. Yes, thank you. Sorry to take you off course, Mr Parrish. This is a question that might equally be put to the Minister, but so, so if, if you're not sure, just feel free to say you don't know, but in your view, um, was this the sort of submission that the minister or a minister would be looking for when they were proposing to uh, suspend a council and invite written submissions? Mr Parrish, I'm not sure in that form it's necessarily a fair question to well, Mr May. Perhaps I'm, it could be done in a different way, but I don't know that Mr May can speak for the minister's mind. No, I wasn't perhaps, suggesting uh, that he should. Um, perhaps I'll rephrase it this way or at least start with this question. Um, have you been involved in suspended councils before? Have I been involved? involved with suspended councils before? Five. And uh, I'm sorry, no, no, no. Uh, three suspended. And you're aware of a process by which submission is sought in written form to provide the minister who was proposing to do something with information and a view from council or councillors? Look, can I answer the question this way? I have no idea what councillors do when they um, are subject to a suspension notice. But the suspension notice was addressed to the governing body. Thank you. Um, I'll take you back to your 10 August. We got a bit sidetracked there. <coughs> and I think I was asking you about your impression as to what led you to um, believe that the meeting was a debacle. Um, leading up to the suspension, and I think you've answered that. Um, if I can just take you over the page, um, page two of the report, by this time you'd commissioned multiple reviews and audits, is that correct? Yes. And but... you, you mentioned that some had been received at the time of the 10 May, and, and some had come in in the meantime, is that correct? Um, what were the issues primarily which came out of those reports that you'd received, which you were drawing to the attention of the Minister? The <coughs> on, on page 245, yes. uh, the review of finances and the governance one, um, their reports that I initiated day one, you could say, uh, because they were um, my due diligence to make sure that I had a handle on what was happening here. The rest of the reports really come from my discussions with residents and staff to get answers uh, for them. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to go through each one if... I'll come back to some of the reports yeah. specifically, but can you tell the Commissioner the major matters that you had to address at that point, in which you set out in the bullet points? Well, it, 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 was, it was trying to... When you get appointed as an administrator or an interim administrator, I think some people think you get writing instructions. Uh, you don't. Um, you, are the, the, you are just asked, can you try and restore public confidence 
um, in the operation of the council. Um, and these reports, and I know there was a few of them, uh, there, but there was a lot more things I could have asked for reports on, uh, for the, re the residents, but this is a result of me listening to residents' concerns, and I took the view uh, that unless I tried to address some of these concerns, it will just go on and on. Um, and there had to be some closure. Um, I, I think the fire report you said you're going to come back to, uh, so I, I can leave that one. Uh, but you know, some of the petty cash stuff, you know, it, it seems minor, but it just sends a message about the whole organisation. Uh, and I think I've got the experience to know where to look and when to look. Uh, and I discounted a lot of what I was told because um, in reality some of it was an opportunity to have a go, uh, but some was genuine. And I, I tried to pick out what I thought would add value to the administration period <coughs> to try and restore public confidence in the council. And that, hence, that's why a lot of those reports were done. Um, and, you know, some of them, at the end of the day, provide a good headline, but they are part of a jigsaw puzzle, in my view. Can I deal with a few of the specific bullet points on page 245? You touched on it briefly, but can you explain what the problem was with the housing strategy and how you went about fixing it? Well, the housing strategy is not addressed here. Uh, Pardon me, I'm, I think I'm looking at the wrong page. It's 246. <coughs> uh, and you've set out some major matters that have been addressed during the administration. I, I won't touch on all of them, but do you see bullet point two, adoption of the, new, of the housing yeah. strategy? Well, the, the council staff... Uh, the, the, the council has an obligation to have a housing strategy um, and a, a planning statement uh, at the end of the day. Um, and the uh, council um, staff, uh, through the general manager, uh, came to me to speak about the problems that they've had with the council in uh, getting a housing strategy formally adopted and in place. Um, and um, I uh, listened and asked them, you know, could they prepare a report for Council on what their professional views were. Um, at the time they also told me about the, the coalitions of convenience uh, in relation to it, um, but I've assured those people I won't breach that confidentiality. Um, and, you know, they told me some stories which, you know, I don't think were embellished. Um, and in the end of the day, I said, well, look, let's, can you do a professional report for me? But I want it to go through the planning panel first uh, for them to have a look at it, uh, as I've done with all um, planning matters. They're the professionals, um, and there are local representatives on that. Um, and we've now adopted the housing strategy, and there hasn't been a whimper, because what we've done in addition to that uh, has said that, and this forms part of the bigger picture of taking the council forward, um, I asked the staff could they do another report for the community to lay out what the processes are now. Uh, just because the council has adopted a housing strategy doesn't mean they're going to plonk a thousand houses in each barrel. Uh, there's processes to follow. Um, and can you make sure that report recognises that lessons have been learnt? Uh, because, you know, you can't make mistakes and not, not own up to it. Uh, now, I'm not saying it was the staff um, who made those mistakes. Um, I think there was a lack of leadership with the council in, in getting to an end position. Um, but the person, uh, the people in, involved in that section, I think, are very competent. Um, and I've been out with them to look at it. Um, and some residents have made representations to me. Um, and um, I've sided with the staff when they've explained to me why. Um, but we then went to the process of, we, as I said, you just don't plonk those houses out there. There's a whole process you've got to go through about, um, well, the simplest way I put it is, you know, when you're up zone, the landowner should, shouldn't just get a pot of gold. 
uh, and they walk away and leave it to the developer to fight it out with the council and the residents. Now, you need to have processes in place. And that's what we are now working on. And as a matter of fact, the general manager and myself met with the Minister of Planning the other day uh, because the land use planning in this place has no strategic focus. We need time to get it right. Um, and we're gone on uh, knees to the Minister to try and get some money to, to help us, um, to be quite frank. It's beyond the financial capability of this council uh, to catch up with the legacy issues that have been inherited through, and I don't want to go on about this, but I think it suited the council not to have all of these things in place because there was a control. Um, whereas if you deal with it at the upper level, and that's the councillor role, everything else falls into place. It's, it's not easy. Uh, but it works, and you know I think the uh, community strategic planning processes of, of, of the local government act aren't too bad. Um, it's just those who don't want to follow them um, and who want to have control. But but a council at the end of the day, the governing body has total control over these things. The fact that it hadn't been done or um, or achieved over some time, did, were you able to form a view as to why? that it got to that stage? Yes, de a definite view. And, and what is the, it? It didn't suit the councillors or some of the executive staff. And w when you say it didn't suit them, what do you mean by that? Well, they had more control over the process. I see. They had more, and that's what I, I said earlier. In re there seemed to me to be a slight resistance to the idea of a panel when I asked the, the staff to prepare the documentation for it. I kind of got, you know, why? Um, well, why was clear uh, to me, uh, but the those who want to micromanage um, and have control lose that control because the bigger picture uh, takes over. Um, you know, I, I've met with the. Sorry uh, to interrupt you, but just the, the but the councillors would have an opportunity to exert their influence at the policy stage, would they not? Total. Yes. And they could set the direction, yeah. rather than getting perhaps a poor choice of words, but getting down into the weeds when things came to be considered later. Is that? But, but the community would have a consistent um, approach. Yes. And at the next election, if they wanted to get rid of them, they could. But but it wouldn't be higgledy piggledy. Uh, not what you know, who you know, planning type thing. Yes. Uh, you would have a, a consistent approach. Um, uh, and um, you know, residents want consistency. Um, they just they don't want to an ad hoc approach to planning. Um, and, and does that tie there, back? There are, sorry, no, sorry, I interrupted you. You go on. There, there, there are some um, overarching rules, though, from the state uh, in relation to LEP development. Look, uh, Commissioner, I, I was at a meet. I'm still going out to meetings as much as I can because I'm trying to reconnect this council, particularly with the villagers uh, who feel robbed. Um, and it's a slow process, but I think we're getting there. I was up at a meeting at uh, Bundanoon, um, and a resident up there um, indicated to me that we're going about this the wrong way. Uh, we had to deal with the LEP first and then get all this information. And you know, when I said to that person that you cannot down zone, um, the person wouldn't accept it. And so at the end of the day, I was quite firm. and said, well, the reality is you just can't down zone. What we're trying to do at the moment, and it's not a, a, a quick fix, we're trying to get the community back in control of this shire. Uh, and this is the way you do it. Uh, you do these studies, you do this consultation, you do this uh, research. You know, the, the days of having things imposed on you, even by the state, uh, the council should be in a position um, where they're responding to what the community's expectations for what the Shire should be. Um, the reality is whether people down here like it or not, and I hear a lot of reference to all these people who come down from Sydney and take over, it's a nonsense. Um, you know, people will come here, but people have been coming here for generations, potentially mostly from Sydney. But, but the council 
needs to have an overarching vision uh, for what it wants, just not, not being picked off. Look, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a soapbox now, but, but I, I look at Station Street um, and the, then I look at Old South Road. Now, I live in Manly. When I go home and you put it in your GPS, it will take you along Old South Road. Um, I wouldn't go along Old South Road. It's the, there's potholes everywhere. It's a shocker. But the council lost a huge opportunity when all that development, and you probably don't know about the development in East Bowral, there's a lot of it. If they had had their strategic planning in place, they'd have done things properly. Um, Old South Road could have been done, but basically funded from all that development. Lost opportunity. Um, you know, the, in, in my view, and some people don't like this, but a lot of developers have taken their pot of gold and run and left the problems to the council uh, and the community. And at the end of the day, that's something that's happened over a long time. And the general manager and myself are now trying to take control back for the community uh, of the area they live in. Does that require strong, overarching strategic plans to be able to achieve that? Oh, definitely, yes. And was that something that was lacking, in or has been lacking over time? In my view, yes. Thank you. Um, so, an example, and um, I think the General Manager sent to you the roadmap. Uh, I, I, we have, it, we, uh, I was aware that it had been, I've been made aware that it was done and we've obtained a copy of the last council business papers, I think. Yes. From those well, 16. Well, what, 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 ha what happened with that was, uh, Miss Ms. Campbell, uh, almost on Christmas Eve, uh, said to me, look, can you have a look at this? Uh, this is my snapshot of where we've been, where we are, where we've got to get to. Um, I took it home over Christmas and I read it and I said, I think this is fantastic. Uh, have you got time to do this? Uh, and anyhow, uh, and then um, I said, "Do I think some of your dates are very, very, very ambitious? Um, because you know th this is going to take time." Um, I then said to her that this is something that the community deserves to have, because they can then get a snapshot. Um, and she was a bit hesitant, um, but we agreed in the end that it would go to council. And I think it's a document that residents should read. Uh, to see the complexity of what the council's got itself into and how, with this roadmap, um, and I'm not saying the council's got to follow it to the nth degree, but it, but it clearly shows operationally how the general manager is thinking. And um, they're, they're the kind of things that should happen. Yes. I might, um, Mr Parrish might take that up with you after morning tea. Is that a convenient time? Oh, I have one yes. clarifying question. Yes. And more so perhaps a, a dumbing down for my own benefit. Um, when you say that the housing strategy, there was a in a impetus or a um, convenience and not passing it because it may have taken power away from councillors or executive staff. Are you saying by that that a housing strategy would remove some of the discretion which lay with councillors and executive staff, and that discretion was, in your impression at least, um, in their interests to hold on to? Mm, not that simple. Okay. The, 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 um, I shouldn't have dumbed it down. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Look, I know a little about a lot up here, um, and basically what I've been told by staff uh, yes. and residents. It's my understanding that there were, in effect, trade-offs um, around Robinson and Collarvale, uh, which the staff thought were disgraceful. Uh, and whether any of those people have made submissions, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm keeping their confidence at what they told me. But when I went to Robinson, and I've had several meetings in Robinson, um, the residents down there are happy for some more development um, because they understand the problems of housing. Um, and um, it's complicated, but there's another issue 
in the Shire, and that's these dormant lots. There's about 3,000 dormant lots in the Shire. Um, now, the, the value of land is now such that they're, they're going to get developed. Um, and you go to Bundanoon, and people aren't happy about it because the council doesn't have an overarching plan to, to deal with it. And I think at the last meeting, we allocated some money to deal with that. Um, so the, the, the council professional officers know what they're doing. Um, and I'm not saying that the council has to rubber stamp it. Uh, all I'm saying is they, they should listen um, and be part of the action rather than just wanted to meddle in, in little things. Thank you. Is that a convenient time, Mr. Yes. Page? Mr. May, we're just going to break for about 20 minutes to restore all our cognitive functions. Uh, so if you'd be kind enough to be ready to resume at about 10 to 12. Thank you. Thank you. Lejeune. Well,
Yes, Mr. Parrish. Mr. May, this might be the time to um, tender some documents through you. I'm going to show you two documents um, that I propose to tender to the inquiry, and I'll just get you to identify those documents. Hopefully the first document you've got is your submission to the inquiry dated 28 October 2021. Correct. Uh, Commissioner, I'll tender that. It's the um, submission by the Office of the Interim Administrator, Winch Garabee Shire Council, being Mr May. Dated 28 October 2021. Yes, Exhibit L will be uh, the submission of Mr May to the inquiry dated 28 October 2021. Uh, that's already in the public domain, so they yes. can go on the website um, as soon as that can happen. Yes. And the second document there, uh, I think it's about 100 pages almost, uh, starts <laughs> number nine, General Manager... 9.1, our roadmap moving forward to reset our organisation. Do you see that? Yes. Is that the document you are referring to produced by Miss Miss Campbell before the break? Yes. Um, I, I think you gave some, by and large, positive evidence about it just before the break. But um, can you just tell the Commissioner, is this a useful document going forward to um, chart a... Um, structure for this organisation? Uh, most definitely. Um, this lays out, uh, it was originally, as I said, it was originally just going to be an operational thing for the staff and as I understand that the general manager has circulated this to staff, uh, so there's clear um, guidelines for the staff about where the organisation is going um, and I suggested to her that it's just as important for the community. Uh, to know where the organisation is going, because uh, in effect, the, in my view, that it's got to be open and transparent in the days of secrecy uh, should go. Uh, and she agreed. Um, this document, in effect, indicates you know where we've been, where we are, but where the general manager, as the in effect the chief executive of the organisation, wants to take it. So it'll be very handy for anybody who wants to stand for a, a election too. Uh, because it's got a, a long uh, horizon. And from that last observation, do I take it it's an important document <coughs> for the next governing body to understand and have buy-in in the process? I believe so, yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, I'll tender that document, Commissioner. It's our roadmap, colon, moving forward to reset our organisation, it's just over 100 pages long. Yes, bundle of documents with the first page being an extract from the agenda, the ordinary meeting of council on 16 March 2022, uh, item 9.1, our roadmap, Colin, moving forward to reset our organisation will be exhibit M. And that is also a document that I understand is in the public domain, so that exhibit can be placed on the inquiry website as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. One topic we were touching on shortly before the break was the housing strategy. And I'd just like to ask you, the general strategic planning framework that was in place, uh, did you see that as sufficient at the time that you came on board and started reviewing the Council? I adopted the status quo, uh, what the governing body uh, was putting forward. Um, and I think it has some holes in it, but I haven't been through every word of it. Um, but that was the direction that the governing body wished to take the council. Uh, you understand how they, you know, 10-4 and one-year one plans. And that's what I'm trying to emphasise that if 
councillors stick to the 10 and the 4 and adopt the 1, they'll get far better out of it for their community than trying to input stuff into it uh, along the way. Obviously it's got to be amended, but um, I, the, the only um, huge concern I have in relation to the community strategic planning of the organisation is in relation to land use planning, because that's what I've turned my attention to since um, so many issues have been brought to my attention. I think you mentioned before the break quite early that you have some views on the land use planning in this council and you may have touched on some of them and other answers but is there anything else you want to share with us about the land use planning policies of this council and where they uh, need to go? No, accepting it's my view that the council has to take its community with it in these processes. Can we go to page 246 of Tender Bundle B, which we were on, um, and we were talking about dot point two, adoption of housing strategy. Do you see that? Yes. Can we just go to the next one? Adoption of a new structure. Can you tell us how that came about and what new structure you're referring to there? Well, the, the, the local government act provides that the structure is approved by the governing body of, of the council. Um, and it also provides that every four years when a new council comes in, you've got to review the structure. Uh, this council had a structure of, in effect, two directorates. Um, and in, you'll see in my minutes also that I've been critical of it in that it doesn't pay enough attention to strategic direction. Uh, it's more just day-to-day -day operational stuff. Um, and I asked, uh, I have my own views, because I've been around a long time and what a structure should look like. Um, I asked the um, Acting General Manager, Mr McMahon, what his views on the structure were. Because we, we, we had time uh, in relation to this because of the I issue with... <laughs> of trying to get a General Manager uh, for the place. That's an, another story altogether. But we had time to begin to, to look at the structure. And I asked Mr McMahon to have a look. Uh, and I asked Ms Rockenbala to, for her view also, because she's an expert in that area, uh, and the general manager came forward with a structure uh, which has three directorates and um, she, I shouldn't say she, the general manager um, is going to have two other reporting uh, special projects, strategic uh, and um, in effect um, staffing matters. Um, so that's what, that's what that talks to. Thank you. But in relation to that it's been slower because there have been some industrial issues as I understand it that have slowed down what the general manager can do when she now goes to group managers and functions. Uh, but I think those hurdles are out of the way and they're, they're moving forward. But this the document we just tabled outlines that process. Thank you. And I don't want to harp on, but we, she, the general manager also has to deal with the staff consultative committees and the unions. There's processes that must be followed uh, and are being followed. Thank you. I'm going to take you shortly to some of the reports which were commissioned, so I'll skip a few of those bullet points. But can I go down to second from the bottom? The provision for certainty, the provision of certainty for the community on major politically destabilising issues, you've referred to a few of those already. One was Station Street. Can you tell the Commissioner uh, the view you formed about the Station Street project and what you did about it? Um, Station Street raises its head in this community all the time. Um, and when I arrived, um, there was a lot of uncertainty about what the Council's position was. Um, there was a, 
a lot of rumour, which some of which I think became fact. Um, and we just need to be open and transparent. The um, council had reports um, that it hadn't released uh, in relation to it. Um, and I think some of the concerns about leaking of information comes from Station Street too. But in effect, what was you know a, a project under 10 million uh, <coughs> ends up a project over 30 million, of which the council only had in round figures about you know 17. Um, I, I think that some people thought the council was just going to head off and do it, um, but the committee would have known what the council was going to do uh, because the council wasn't being open and transparent and honest about it. Um, I arrived. Um, I had watched what was being said about it at council meetings. Um, I met with uh, the Friends of Barrel group. Um, I also met with individuals uh, who were less vocal in the community, but who wanted to have a say and are entitled to a say. You have to just haven't got to be in an organisation to be heard. Um, and I formed the view that it really didn't matter and I'm not a traffic engineer, it's just common sense. It really just didn't matter what the council did uh, in Station Street. You're not going to fix the problems in Bong Bong Street. Um, and then there was the question of the Pin Oaks. Do you know the area at all? Yes, I've, I've, I've viewed it and I'm aware of the, the Pin Oaks, yeah. yes. Well, I wasn't going to be responsible for taking those Pin Oaks down. Um, this is quite as simple as that. Um, and the road pavements are a disgrace. Um, I was lucky that Mr McMahon is an engineer. Um, and I said, help. Um, we've got to sort this out because it just can't keep festering along. Um, and that led to a report um, which was professionally driven in this organisation. Uh, that came to a conclusion which I think has been accepted by the community. Um, what, what I was trying to get onto earlier was if the council had have done its strategic planning properly, I think a lot of the traffic impacts on Station Street and Bong Bong Street would disappear because people travelling north from Moss Vale would use Old South Road, but the council lost that opportunity. So if they were just compounding issues, but um, Station Street was an issue. Um, it was obviously underscoped. Um, there has been concern that um, a grant, part of a grant was given back. Um, but you can't mislead government. Um, the, the, the criteria that government set for the grant weren't achieved. Um, the view was expressed, and tell me if you're not in a position to uh, express a view about it, but there was a at least a perception um, at various times that the project was being driven forward because of that grant. That is, we've got it, so we've got to use it type mentality. Did you observe anything like that to enable you to express a view? Can't express a view. Yes. I, uh, my, my view is that it had. Uh, it, 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 the, the council dug itself a hole and it just couldn't get out of it. And you know, I don't know whether you're aware, but they, 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 were, they were talking about, you know, even the Department of Transport contacted me about this project. Um, the, the council was looking at moving the car parking at Barrel to Mittagong Station. Yes. Um, you know, and, and, they, and they weren't being upfront with the community about the reasons why. And so that, that bred um, mystery. Um, and, you know, well, I, I think we've addressed it. And um, look, there, there's no question, something is, there's going to have to be a bypass one day. Um, but the council does not have the funding at the moment. And there may be other ways to achieve it. Yes. Just before um, I hand back to Mr Parrish, could Mr May be shown Exhibit K? I just want to ensure that I'm understanding that passage of his evidence.
in um, in your answer a moment ago, you referred to a report that had been driven in the organisation and one that I think you said you come to the view has achieved some acceptance within the community. Is this the report that you're referring to? Yes. Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, that can be, Mr Broad, that can be t taken from Mr May. I don't have any other questions about it at the moment. Mr Parrish. Thank you, Commissioner. I want to take you to a few of the reports which were commissioned and their conclusions. It seems probably the best way to do it is to go through the same order of um, the matters raised by you in your report. So starting with the bushfire response and recovery review, You've got a bullet point there on page four of your report. Um, can you start by telling us why that review was commissioned? When I went um, on um, my trips to the um, north and southern villages in particular, I was stunned um, by the effects of the fire and then when I began to hear personal stories about the alleged council in action, um, I couldn't believe it. Um, this is remote of the actions of the emergency services. This is the council's response. Um, I then spoke to a one of the new acting Deputy General Managers, um, and she indicated to me there had been failures, uh, uh, both on the council, part of the council and the administration. Um, and I said, well, look, we need to give everybody an opportunity to have their say. Um, can you do me a briefing note on what happened? I think it was on the Thursday or the Friday. Um, on the Monday, um, the person came to me um, and said, uh, Mr May, this is bigger than a briefing note. Uh, you're going to have to have a, a review, I think, um, because the community is not going to accept that. The community doesn't... doesn't um, um, they're suspicious of us, and I think it's a cover-up. Um, you need to get somebody external to get the review. Um, I spoke to uh, some potential people and then the person who had come to me originally um, said to me that um, she had found Dave Owens uh, who was recommended to her uh, by I think the RFS um, and he'd undertaken the state review, was part of the state review. Um, I said, well look, um, we now need to do a brief uh, but you must be very clear that this is the council's response. We can't get into other territory. Um, and that happened, and really the, the rest is history. I think um, of everything I've done here, that's had the most human effect, that report. Um, and I think residents appreciate it, and it certainly showed up the shortcomings of both the governing body and the administration but more particularly the behaviours of the governing body, uh, as residents told their stories to Mr Owen, um, and staff confidentially told their stories to Mr Owen. Um, after the report went to council, and the general manager and I discussed it prior, um, I said we need to get somebody independent of the council now to look at all these recommendations, because there's a lot of them and there's a lot of failures, and it's going to cost us a lot of money to move forward. Uh, but it can't happen again because there'll be more fires, there'll be more emergencies. Um, Ms. Miss Campbell then indicated to me that um, Leanne Barnes, who was the former general manager of Beaver Valley, who lived through the fires, um, was available. Um, I actually then spoke to Mr. Owen to get his view on her taking forward the recommendations, and he thought that was an excellent choice. In that conversation, he said to me that 
Look, there, there is a matter that I didn't put in the report, which I should alert you to. Um, he said there were 17, recommend uh, 17 submissions by staff, 15 of them requested confidentiality in fear of retribution. You know, that stung me. Particularly with the council administration, um, uh, and um, they've, they've been worked through. There's further reports gone to council about this now. <coughs> it's been a whole of council response, um, and um, you know, I've, I haven't discussed it at a foot with the former councillors at all. I've, I've, I've moved on, uh, but there are some things in there which you know are quite unbelievable. What does that tell you about the culture, at least at the time when the report was done, when 15 out of the 17 staff were fearful of retribution? Definitely. What does and, that tell you about that culture? What does it tell you? What does it tell you about the, 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 the culture? Well, I've got to be quite frank. It, it worried me because I'd been here a few months, and if staff were still worried, this was very deep seated. Uh, and, you know, the reality is people have been moved on from the organisation where there's still some there that, you know, were a concern uh, to the, the rank and file, if I could put it that way. But I, I don't think it was. I think the, the major concern um, and the, some of the staff have since spoken to me about it, their major concern was when the elections were held and some of those councillors coming back, they'll be targets. And, you know, that's just not acceptable. Um, but uh, it's... It, it, it's and, I, and I think, to a degree, in this organisation, there is still an undercurrent of fear uh, that, you know, certain councillors get back, um, it's going to be on again. Can I ask you about the deficiencies that you recall in the preparation stage rather as opposed to the response stage? Well, well the, the council really had no um, emergency plan to deal with it. Um, that, that's that's the, the, the bottom line. Um, and it was catch-up all the time. The And I... Well, you're dealing beforehand, so I'll, I'll deal with it after later. The... the plan you're talking about is that, in your view, the sort of strategic core job of a governing body to, to set those plans and the policies? The council has a statutory obligation. Um, there was a plan in place, I think, from about 2015. Uh, do you recall whether that was either outdated or um, inadequate for purpose? I don't, but based on information that staff have given me, it would have been outdated. Thank you. Um, we've already had witnesses describe their impressions of the governing body's conduct and response after the fires, both from your um, experience in the community and from the report, what was your impression of how the governing body and the council is disgraceful. individually? Disgracefully. If, if someone said it was black, somebody else said it was white. Uh, there was no civic leadership and from uh, talking to staff there and reading the report, it's my view that the governing body, as the governing body, and the executive took the view, not our problem, move on. Can I take you to page 310 of the tender bundle? Exhibit B? Yes. Yes. Uh, at the top there, I th hopefully you have the pa page which commences. The review found that the mayor was divisive, divisive within the community, 
polarising opinion during the feedback sessions. Um, do you think that's a fair criticism in your view and from what you've learned? I, I find it difficult to have a view on that. Yes. Simply because some of what I was told by residents that the Mayor is alleged to have said, I find totally unbelievable. Um, and hence, that's one of the reasons, you know, I, I think, I, I, don't, I don't have the ability, and I wouldn't, to address those, those kind of issues with individual uh, people, but um, I, I'm not surprised. Having not heard from the Mayor yet, or not having not given him the opportunity yet to respond to those allegations, assuming that certain things were said, which I assume you're referring to, assuming they were said, do you think they were appropriate things to say? Most definitely not. Moving to the next sentence, a small number within the community believe that he, being the Mayor, did a good job. However, the majority believe that he lacked empathy towards bushfire victims and presented no plan on behalf of Council for moving forward. Um, is that a fair criticism? Is that, in your experience, an accurate reflection of what happened? I, I wasn't there at the time. Um, the, the, the this, is a very, this, this has been a very difficult exercise for me, the fires, um, and, and the human cost of the fires. Um, and I wasn't there at the time, but by virtue of the council's lack of formal procedures in dealing with it, and some of additional of what I know about you know, mayor relief funds and that kind of stuff, I'm not surprised, but, but I can't confirm or deny, if I could put it that way. Thank you. Um, the next sentence effectively is a restatement in so far as it covers the topic of um, con conduct which was inappropriate and lacking empathy. It then says it was apparent that the Mayor lacks support from some senior council staff. Is that a fair criticism in your experience from what you've learned? Well, it's my understanding that some of the senior staff are missing in action. Um, the next, uh, uh, sorry, withdraw that. Was the mayor entitled to expect that sort of support from senior council staff? Oh, most, most definitely. Um, just going down to the next paragraph there, uh, it says, Effective communication was hampered by a number of councillors offering assistance and making decisions on behalf of council that they didn't have authority to do. Uh, did you see any evidence of that? Um, no, I didn't. Uh, but having an understanding of how this council ran, uh, I wouldn't at all be surprised. Assuming that councillors did offer assistance and make decisions on behalf of council that they didn't have the authority to do, is that an appropriate or even available thing for them to do? No. In, in, in times like this, you need one voice. Leadership. In your opinion, does that show a lack of effective civic leadership yes. in the local community? Yes. Excuse me for a second, Mr May. Yeah. Let's 
just occurred to me that it might be the time to explore a topic uh, with you that I was going to raise later. Um, you might not have it in front of you, but 232 of the Local Government Act sets out the role of councillors, and I don't expect you to not off by heart, but Commissioner Glover I think, I think in fairness to Mr May, yes. if you're going to ask him about it, he should have it. Mr Broad, Mr yep. May can have my copy of the Act. Just 232. Yeah, it's not one. Two three two is something I was going to explore with you later, but it occurs to me now might be the time in the context of what we've just been talking about. And in particular, two three two subparagraph one F, which says to uphold and represent accurately the policies and the decisions of the governing body. Can I just explore with you what is required of a councillor when decisions are made by the governing body that they may not necessarily agree with or uh, vote for, but it is nevertheless passed as a decision of council? Where is the line? Is there a line in which they can continue to oppose something that was passed? Is there a line where they can continue to agitate something in the community? Or are they effectively bound by a decision once made? The, the, the governing body is bound by the decision, and the individual, by virtue of that, is bound by the decision. However, you can make it very clear that I'm bound by that decision, but I don't agree with it. Yes. Um, and if you're drawing that back to the fires, you know, it, it was just totally inappropriate in those circumstances to be, you know, putting forward your, your own views. Do I take it that certainly the phrase to uphold means whilst you don't have to wholeheartedly embrace it, but you shouldn't take active steps to undermine it? Is that... Is that a fair reading of that section, in your opinion? Yes. Um, and going up a subparagraph to subparagraph E, the role of the councillor is to facilitate communication between the local community and the governing body. Assuming the instance given in the bushfire report that there were councillors effectively making promises that they had no ability mm. to make. What does that do to the facilitation of the communication between the local community and the governing body? Mm. Undermines it. Um, thank you. Commissioner, I was going to move on from the bushfire review specifically, unless you have any... Can I just... Um, just about the bushfire review report in isolation for the moment. Um, I'm aware that a view has been expressed that, that together the reports you commissioned um, revealed relatively insubstantial issues. If I just look at the bushfire report in isolation for the moment, what do you say to the proposition that the bushfire report revealed relatively insubstantial issues? It shows me that those who are saying it have no understanding of their role, if it's coming from councillors, uh, of their role. Um, you know, the, 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 the bushfire report speaks for itself. 
And when you say if that view um, leads you to the conclusion that if it was a councillor that they didn't understand their role, why do you say that? Because the, because if the, the role of the look in my submission to you, uh, I say that the role of the governing body is clear, the role of the, the councillor is clear, etc. Uh, etc. Et yes. Um, it's just it shows there is there could be an understanding, but the, the people concerned may not want to understand. Uh, they might just want to be mischief makers, uh, for all I know. But you, the, the fires were a tragedy, um, and this area got hit hard. Um, and the, um, the, 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 the council, as a corporate, as a, as a governing body, and the executive, uh, just wanting to move on and not take any ownership of the failures, um, just shows a. a, a a clear, if, 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 if people are saying that um, this report was not warranted, they misread the community they're elected to represent. And if one looks at those comments across the whole totality of the reports that were commissioned, I appreciate Mr Parrish hasn't been through them all just yet, but if that comment was applied to each of the reports, that is, overall, they displayed relatively insubstantial issues, what, is, your, is your comment the same? The, the fire report stands by itself. Uh, and some of the other reports, I was selective uh, in where I was going, but I was trying to show trends um, and what was actually going on in the place. Um, and some of the reports, um, look, I was conscious, I ended up spending $115,000 on reports. In my view, money well spent for the community because it exp exposes the reality of the operations of this organisation. Um, some of them perhaps could be seen as minor, but they all fit, in my view, into a bigger picture yes, and they I had, helped me come to the conclusion. I had in mind before morning tea, I think you used the word, it's a jigsaw puzzle, you put it all together to enable an, an overarching view. Is that how I understand how you see it? Yes. Yes. And when looked at as the whole, including the bushfire report, because it's part of it, what do you say to the proposition when viewed as a whole, those reports taken together disclose relatively insubstantial issues? Well, I could have a one word answer, but I've, um, I just think it shows a lack of understanding of what the roles and responsibilities of, of, of the council are. Yes. But, but, at, but at both levels. Uh, at both levels, you mean council law and. Ex Executive operational staff. staff. Executive staff. Executive staff, so, yes. Uh, Thank you. Yes, Mr Parrott. Sorry, Commissioner. Yes. Staff came to me, not even at the third level, but lower levels of the organisation when this was going on and, you know, saying, you know, thank you. Um, it had to come out. Um, they, were, they weren't allowed to talk about it and, you know, for obvious reasons, when you're 15 of the, of the 17. But, you know, so many staff had skin in the game as well. They live here. You know, their, their relatives could, be, could have been affected. It, it had a huge impact on the organisation. Um, and, you know, I, I know that you know, some people say that the, the, the behaviour of the council deteriorated after the fires. Well, it's just that the fires provided evidence that all was not good. Yes, thank you. Yes, Mr Parrish. Um, I might just pop off on a tangent arising out of what has arisen from the Commissioner. Another proposition that is allied with the um, relatively insubstantial issues proposition is the proposition that it's a small but vocal part of the community that is uh, expressing their dissatisfaction and um, by and large the community is happy with the direction of the now suspended council. Do you have a view on that? I've heard this a lot, and yes. talking to councillors, uh, they couldn't understand why you know a handful of people uh, and a couple of disruptive councillors, in their view, had caused all this. Um, there's more than a handful of people. That's why I spent so much time, and you know, I, I I went to the communities and spoke to the people, and the issues were many and varied. Um, I think I said earlier, everybody I spoke to had a story about the council. 
It just wasn't a handful of people. Um, and you know, the the first council meeting I had, I think it had over a thousand views. Uh, that's not a handful of people. Uh, that's people concerned about the future of their local democracy. In that context, can I take you to page 485 of Tender Bundle B, which I think is in front of you? Yes. Uh, that's a community research report dated February 2021, is that I'm right? I'm sorry, page 405? 485. I'm sorry, 485. Sorry. appreciate this report was dated and therefore commissioned before your appointment as interim administrator, but did you have occasion at some point to read and review this report? This report was brought to my attention by Mr McMahon, um, and I wouldn't say I read every word, but I've read the headlines. Do these community research reports have a role to play in the the metrics against which councils measure themselves? Oh, definitely, yes. Um, can I take you to some of the findings? I might start with page 489. Yes. I appreciate you're not a statistician, um, but there was an overall satisfaction rating in this um, finding that at least 65% were somewhat satisfied with the performance of council in the last 12 months. Um, how does that statistic strike you? Is that above average about what you think is no, no, about no, right? No, it's much higher. It should be much higher than that. I might take you to the, the benchmarks in a second. Does it at least um, roughly align with your experiences and what you were hearing from community? Where that, That's a hard question. Yes. Um, if, if, it's, if it's too hard or... It, it's not something you feel like you can give an answer. Well, I, I, I don't think I can give a really in, in okay. form, form. To me, in isolation, 65 seems low, very low, yes. actually. I might take you to the comparative rates first. I think that might be a better way to um, deal with it. Can I take you to page 518 of that report? Do you see there that this is benchmarked against other councils? Um, take your time and have a read of it if, if you want. Whilst Mr May is just familiarising himself with those pages, um, will you be coming back to 498 through to 503? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I'm 
can you give me your impressions of the performance of council based on the statistics we have there? Well, the, the, the areas that impact on the day-to-day -day lives of residents are really the ones that are low scored. Uh, in, in my view, the reality is that 95% of residents aren't really interested in the council unless they have a DA next door uh, or they've got a pot out the front or flooding. They trust you uh, to get on with it. And, you know, I've spent, I've spent a career at Mossman um, telling council staff it's the people who aren't in the room uh, that we've got to represent as well, just not the squeaky wheels. Everyone pays rates uh, and you need fair representation. This shows me that you know the the real issues, the day to day, are scored badly. Um, you know, I the availability of town water. Um, you know, I, I can see why that's scored very high because I, I, I believe that they are true pluses in this organisation, uh, water and sewage. We could do better in the villages, and we're working on that. Um, but they're, they're just taken for granted. They're day to day. You turn the tap on, it works. Um, people don't understand the complexity behind the scenes to make it work. Um, and I've heard of what happened during the fires to make sure things worked, uh, and the dedication of the staff uh, to do that. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think that the, the core issues in, in this place, and you would have heard this many times about roads and potholes and, uh, and stuff um, and building regulations and information to residents, you know, they're all the things that the council should be working on to improve. Yes. Um, can I take you back to 498? It, it might be a little bit hard to read it. It is on mine, but it's page 15 of the actual report. Yes. Perhaps if we could start with the satisfaction scores where we have a bar graph with the years 2021 to 2010 going backwards. Do you see that? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, again, have a read of it to refresh your memory if you need to, but I just want to ask you... No, I've, you, I've seen, looked at this one many times. What's your impression of, well, the, firstly, the trajectory and um, what that tells you... Um, based on your knowledge of the organisation? Well, it, it shows me that there's, there's been a problem over time. Yes. There's, there's, a, there's a deterioration in the, in the communities. Um, but I don't know whether you're aware, but this was not made publicly available, this report. Um, Are you aware why that was? Wouldn't have, oh, I think I know why. Um, no, there's no, there's no structural, legal no, or operational no, 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 reason no, no, why not. No, you know, in this game, you take the good with the bad, um, you learn. Um, and this was an opportunity uh, for the council. I don't know whether this was shared with the councillors. Um, all I know is that Mr McMahon was amazed one day. He said to me, I, I don't believe what I'm finding. And he showed me this. And since then, I've been showed a, a staff, it's actually, it's in uh, the general manager's report, a staff cultural survey which was never made available either. Um, I, I take it from those answers. Your view is these things should be made public as a matter of course in council operations? Using public money to fund it. Asking the public what they think. Yeah. Yes. And, then, and then, you know, potentially not listening. And that's, that's a strong theme I have, that I think this council just stopped listening. And numbers like this, do they also inform your answer to council assisting earlier about the view that this is just a small but vocal section no. of the community that's voicing their displeasure? I, I've rejected that from day one. Yes. It's just a small... You know, it, but is, it, is this a metric when I come to consider that, that view that um, you know, points to the counter position that you favour? Yes. Thank you. 
Can I just ask you about the mean ratings, which are the the bar graphs on the left hand side, which go from left to right? It's the council mean ratings measured against the LGA benchmark um, for regional councils of a similar size. There's, do you see there's a um, reference underneath to the change being significantly higher or lower as a level of satisfaction compared to the bank benchmark? It's a key or a metric in the bottom left hand corner there? Yes. Um, and do you see that for the matters very satisfied and satisfied, there has been a significantly lower level of satisfaction compared to the benchmark? There's an arrow pointing downwards next to each of those. Yes, yes, sorry. It's not the clearest to read as a miss to me. Um, so it's got 3% and then it's got an arrow downwards next to it, next to very satisfied. Yes. And to take the other extreme, if you go down to not at all satisfied, um, the benchmark is 5%. This council is 15% and there's a little arrow next to it pointing upwards. Do you see that? Yes. And that means that, do you agree there has been significantly higher levels as against the mean of not very satisfied and not at all satisfied and significantly lower levels of very satisfied and satisfied? Do you see that? Yes. What does that tell you about, um, firstly, whether or not it is a small minority who are agitating dissatisfaction against the governing body? Well, I have no doubt the, st the statistical base of this survey would be such that it would have, you know, I, I it would have in the front somewhere, whether it's 3 or 5 per cent uh, reliability. Um, that shows, it shows me that... The council's got problems. Yes. Um, and can I turn, uh, Commissioner, I'm going to turn over the page to 501. Is there anything you want to ask on 49? Uh, no, thank you. Can I take you to 501, which is performance of elected councillors? And you'll see there that the question asked is, thinking specifically about the councillors elected in September 2016, how satisfied are you with their performance on the following? And um, it's then broken up into um, a range of questions or topics. The first one is representing a broad range of community matters fairly. If you go over the page, the next one is effective leadership and guidance of the community. And then the next one is performance overall. Looking at performance overall on page 503, and just taking your time to read it if you need to refresh your memory, I'm interested in what your impression is of those community findings. It just shows the community overall is far from satisfied. And that accords with your experience in talking Oh, yes, about yes, yes. And what do you say to the proposition that it's only a small proportion of the community? I, I, just, I just can't, I can't agree with it. I've been from that position about a week after I got here. Just on page 503, Mr Parrish, do I read this survey? There's the five categories from very satisfied down to not at all satisfied. And in the not at all satisfied we have 23 percent with the arrow which signifies a significantly higher or lower rating by year yes. for that category and then not very satisfied 28 percent so we have just over half of responses being not very or not at all satisfied with the overall performance of councillors is that how one 
reads that? Yes, quite. Yes. Thank you. And the trends are at the top. The trends are at the top, and Commissioner, you also see the little arrow up or down next to some of the um, bars gives you a comparison to 2019. Yes, the, the lighter box in the bar is the previous survey. Yes. Yes. Uh, Mr Mayor, just uh, you may have already answered this in an earlier question, just for my clarification. It's not only the individual scores per survey that matter, it's the trends that are also relevant, aren't they? It, it, it's the trend is what's important. Yes. Yeah. And uh, these numbers depict a declining trend overall. Why is that a matter of concern in these types of surveys? Well, because that, that's the community's uh, or the stakeholders' view on the elected body. Yes. Yeah. Th thank you, Mr Parrish. Commissioner, I've done that a bit out of order in the way that I wanted to deal with it, but having done that now, is there any other questions yeah. you want to ask on that? No, that's probably my fault. Um, no, no, no. Uh, no, thank you. Um, Mr May, I want to turn back to dealing with some of the reports specifically now. Um, and the next report I wanted to ask you about was the earnest consulting report on planning development and regulatory services, and specifically the second report that was titled Writing the Wrongs. And that... Um, report is at page 434 of the tender bundle. <coughs> yes. Can you tell me about why you commissioned that, this report and the context of it? I commissioned this report because I was overwhelmed with the number of people who were approaching me about development issues. Uh, I, I'm not a planner, um, and I couldn't cope with the number, and I couldn't give constructive uh, answers to the residents who were approaching me, because really, um, it's not my area of expertise. Um, I was quite clear uh, when I did a report Minute and look, everything I've done, I've done by I've kept the community informed of where I was heading by uh, administrator minute. And in that report, I said I'd I'd be um, heading off in in this direction, um, but we weren't going to reopen issues. Um, and um, I think over 60 people ended up seeing uh, Mr. Ryan. I had no hope of dealing with that, um, and I. Th He's very experienced in this arena, and I think he was shocked. I think it was 83 interviews with members of the community. And I'm sorry. In your ex no, but in, in your experience, is that a significant number of people to come forward to? I think it's unbelievable. Yes. Thank you. And um, on page 435 of the tender bundle, we've got the themes that arose from interviews with staff members and over the page we've got observations from the public. Um, by all means, take your time to refresh your memory if you need to, but yeah, I don't can, you, can you tell me whether their observations and themes accorded with your experience from what you'd been dealing with? From the small sample that I had, this confirms, with a bigger sample, what I was being told. And one of the issues you raised was the observation of interference in political games in matters of strategic importance, such as the housing strategy. We've covered that area in some depth, I think, but is there any other matters you wish to add on that observation that we haven't discussed this morning already? Uh, no, no, not... Um, I think it's just, just the importance of now getting it right. Uh, when it comes to the future uh, growth in this community. Um, in, in, in relation to the specifics of, uh, of the Ernst Consulting report, 
um, last Monday um, after the hearings opened and I went out to get some lunch, a resident stopped me uh, at the entrance of the council and introduced themselves and said they were still battling an issue where there was councillor interference um, and a councillor went on his site with a council employee. I said, look, I'm, they're operational matters. I can't really help you. Speak to the general manager. But it just, it just, it's a never-ending, never-ending. Can I clarify, was that something which was happening post-local planning panel even? No, oh, no, it would have been prior. Prior. Yeah. And assuming, I assume that's prior to the suspension as well, based on. Oh yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. yes. And, and look, and, and, and an observation I would make um, is that if everything was going so well in the planning department, why did residents feel the need to engage uh, former council employees to navigate the complexity of the council systems? And that happens still today with recently departed employees. Can I ask you a few specific questions about the report? I might start high level at least. On page 437, um, there are the observations by Ernest Consulting. I won't go through every one of them, but did you by and large agree with the observations that have been made by Ernest Consulting from your own experience and from your own feedback? I was surprised um, by the observations, they seemed even stronger than what I thought. Thank you. And turning to a couple of specific issues, can you pop over the page to page 438? Um, third paragraph down there, Mr Ryan concludes, there appears to be a very limited adherence by the elected council and senior staff to the normal pillars of the Local Government Act regarding the relationship between councillors and staff, the use of the Code of Conduct, declarations of interest and planning matters and detailed and comprehensive communications with the community are not seen to be adhered to by staff or the community. Can I ask two questions there? Um, it refers to um, the impressions of the community. Does that accord with um, what you understand the impression of the community to be from your consultations and experience? Yes, and this is, an, to me, this is another source coming from another angle confirming that view. And in respect to the observation, there appears to be limited adherence by the elected council and senior staff to the normal pillars of local government act regarding the relationship between councillors and staff. Was that your experience as well? Most definitely. Um, are you aware or did you sub subsequently become aware of the normal pillars of the local government act that Mr Ryan is referring to there? Yeah, I, I would think there he is talking about openness and transparency. Um, and um, just going over to page 445 now. There are five high-level recommendations from Mr Ryan with sub-recommendations. Do you by and large agree with those recommendations and have you taken steps to implement strategies along the lines of those recommendations? Yes, but I think the general manager has taken them even further yes. now. And, and, and I think from a staffing perspective, it's extremely important 
that through that pathways document, uh, the staff can recognise they're being respected and they're being heard. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, I was going to move on from that document for now. Um, the next topic I want to <coughs> ask you about over the page in your report is the Civic Centre refurbishment project. Which page of the bundle? Uh, that is page to? six of uh, the report, and it is page... 249. 249, yes, correct. Sorry, 249. Right? 249, uh, there's a dot point which commences... Civic Centre refurbishment project. Can you give the inquiry some um, explanation about how capital expenditure of this type works when the council wants to spend a significant amount of money on a council asset or, or a strategic um, asset? Well, well, the council should do a, a, a business plan. Yes. Uh, and then you have to make application to OLG uh, for the expenditure of the, of the monies. That's, in short, uh, what happens. And there are OLG procedures in place yes, yes. for the sorts of yes. expenditure that we're talking about? Uh, it, it, there's, there's a rule. I think it's a million dollars or 10% of rate income or... Yes. Something like that. But there are clear rules which, um, and I think they might be um, a CEO's directive from LG New South Wales. There's a provision in the Act. Uh, where 23A or um, was that on? I'm not sure. The thing that says you have to, when a directive comes down, you have to take it into account in your operations. Is that the one you have in mind? There's another. Or is there a different um, one? directive that the CEO can give, um, and I can have a look later, that might be it. Uh, but in other words, you've got to do it. I oh, see. So, yes, well, that seems stronger than 23A, but yeah. yes, thank you. Can I just pause to say, Commissioner, it's one o'clock now. Given that Mr May is the only witness for the day, yes. uh, subject to your convenience and officers, I think I can push through and maybe finish in the next half hour. Which yes. Mr May, ordinarily I'd take... Um, lunch and adjournment about now, but seeing as though council assisting only has about half an hour to go with you, um, is it, are you happy to sit on, or if you need a break at any time, just tell me. Oh, no, no, I'm uh, happy to sit on. Happy. Yeah. All right, if you need a break at any time, just yeah. let me know, and that can be accommodated. Yes, Mr Parrish. Yeah, we're obviously sitting in the Civic Centre now, so I don't need context necessarily about the fit-out and the... Um, refurbishment was taking place, but can you tell the inquiry uh, why it was necessary or the context around why um, you commissioned a report from Finch Consulting about it? From Finch? Yes. I commissioned that report uh, because of what was said by certain councillors at the meetings either the 9th or the 10th, um, and I had a look myself and I was confused. Uh, now, I'm not saying I'm a finance professional, but I understand the basics. Um, and I just couldn't add it up. Um, and then when I looked further, um, and I was tipped off uh, to the fact that the uh, capex hadn't been done to OLG properly. Um, and then um, it was Mr McMahon, really, who raised concerns with me about uh, the council's application saying it was all about occupation, health and safety at the end of the day. Um, and apparently uh, not much has happened outside of public areas and the executive areas. Um, I then took an interest um, in how come, and I'm pricing this down, ha how come all of a sudden um, when it's not, not in any plans and it's not disclosed to OLG, 
that you can get offices for the mayor and general manager, uh, which I can only describe as palatial. You're quite welcome to go and have a look. Uh, um, I feel embarrassed sitting in there when I think about what the staff's sitting in. Um, but I'm afraid I just can't get to the truth. I don't know what's happened. I, last I knew, the general manager uh, was having a look at emails, uh, but she indicated to me that that my words, not hers, the emails in effect say come and see me, uh, rather than uh, having a, a, um, a line. Um, and uh, I'm uh, still at a loss uh, to understand. I, I understand that there was leaks and something had to happen, you know, but uh, the grandeur of it all, uh, when this was not the reason why they were doing it, as I understood it, is a bit over the top. When you say there were emails to the extent of come and see me, what level are we talking about? Councillor to councillor, executive no, staff to executive staff? Executive level. Um, and look, I, I, I don't know who's been talking to you, but you know, certain employees at this place have tipped me off to stuff. Um, but they're frightened to put their head up. Yeah, because, you know, uh, council will come back and the ballot box will determine who's elected. You may have seen council meetings in which matters about the civic centre refurbishment are raised. Um, in your view, was the dialogue and what was tabled at council meetings done appropriately and transparently? Totally inappropriate. Um, and I think this is another case uh, where things have been done in what they call briefings or um, workshops. Look, I've been in local government a long time and I've seen now a lot of councils. I've never seen workshops and briefings like this. Um, it's just... It's, I, I just... It's not a transparent way to do business. And, you know, no wonder the community is suspicious. And councillors who weren't in the know. Can I ask you, in your experience, what the purpose of those briefings or workshops should be in a normal council process? Well, I might be old school, uh, but I come from a, a position where if you can't put enough information in a report for a council or to make an informed decision, get another job. This idea of counting numbers and seeing where the land lies in workshops and... Um, and uh, uh, briefings, um, I just I just can't agree with them. And you might notice that I've changed the code of uh, meeting procedures here. And we actually had one yesterday, um, a, a workshop, which will be reported to council. Um, I don't want to be critical of the staff. I thought it was fabulous. But they could have put it in reports and I could have read it. Um, but in fairness, it was very beneficial for the residents who came because uh, they were able to see a bit behind the scenes. Um, but we could do that by having a committee of the whole. There's, a, there's an opportunity for that, which is a less formal way of doing a meeting. But um, I th my personal view is uh, that I think the code of meeting practice, the model code of meeting practice, should be amended uh, to make it mandatory uh, that workshops um, and um, um, briefings are reported back to council. You know, there, there are reports uh, that I've heard where you know there, there were Donny Brooks at these briefings and workshops in this council as well. Um, you know, it's, uh, as part of that, do I understand you to be of the view that workshops and briefings should be public? Well, they, I did it at Armadale because they. They went to tender to sell an airport uh, at a briefing, yes. uh, from, following a briefing. And, and when I came here, I took particular interest in it. But they've taken it to a new level, the briefings here. Um, yes. you know. I'm just having in mind your views about the model code of meeting practice. Do you think that it should specify as the default position oh, yes, that briefings and workshops yes. should be... Yes. Public, public, whether yes. streamed or members of the public can come and view. Is that your view? Yes, yes. Yes, and um, 
aside from the obvious transparency benefits, are there any other benefits that you see in having those briefings and workshops public rather than held confidentially? Well, I, 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 I would hope it would lead councils to do stuff in either committee or um, for council where there are strict guidelines under the regulations. Um, as I said earlier this morning, um, I'm a little bit... I haven't taken any legal advice, and you gentlemen would know a lot better than me, but I just don't know whether uh, under, these, uh, under the, the rules for briefings and workshops, you can make it mandatory that you um, got to keep stuff confidential. Whereas under the Act, uh, for meetings and, and council meetings, you can. Now, I know that this council changed their code of meeting practice to do that. Um, however, it's not a mandatory provision. Yes, so accompanied with uh, a recommendation, perhaps, that the model code should specify briefings and workshops to be public would, I assume, carry with it the option to declare part of it confidential if appropriate in accordance with the confidentiality provisions in 10B. I'm, I'm stretching my memory about the confidentiality provisions of meetings in the Act. Mm. So I, I some matters might be confidential and properly so. Do you agree with that? I still prefer to deal with confidential matters in a more formal arena. Yes, being a council meeting. Yes, or, or, or a committee meeting where there's ample opportunity I see. and you can do it. But I, I think for the betterment of local government generally, yes. these briefings are taking off. Uh, and I think that then breeds a bit of suspicion with residents, or here it has for sure. Yes, and if they were public, would it, in your view, um, deter informal decision-making in briefings, which shouldn't be happening. Definitely, yes. yes. And, and it would be for people to see what is actually what, what is actually happening. And um, would it also ensure or guard against the risk that real or perceived some councillors may feel they have less information than others? Yes. Because you will find that some councillors, as a matter of principle, won't go to briefings. Yes. Because they're awake up to what goes on. Yes. And look, and... I was a general manager for a long time. Um, some general managers count heads um, before they put a recommendation out. I'm not saying that happened here, but I'm, my suspicions are. Uh, yes, I understand. Yes, Mr Parrish. I don't quite understand what you mean by count heads. Could, could you well, that, if you haven't got the numbers, don't waste your time. Look, it, and, and actually, from recollection, um, at the meeting on the 10th, I think it was, when they were, th this council was giving consideration to the future of the council, there was a reference uh, by one of the councillors to the briefing, and oh, we made that decision in the briefing. Um, I'm pretty confident I heard that. Um, and that was about this building and the expenditure of the money, the seven or $800,000 next door. Um, yeah, that's not good enough. I was going to ask you about it later, but I might raise it now. Um, immediately above your reference to the Civic Centre refurbishment project in your um, 10 August report, you refer to the de facto council meetings. Mm. Is that what we've just been talking about, this propensity for the council to have closed briefings and effectively make decisions which ought to have been made at yes. an open council meeting. Yes. yes. Um, and where did um, your knowledge and information of that come from? Was it staff um, who were reporting back to you that this was the sort of thing that was going on? or Staff and some councillors. Okay. Some councillors in my discussions expressed concern uh, about the number and they were surprised my, by my view uh, that it is the obligation of a council officer through the general manager to provide inf enough information to council as the governing body to be able to make a decision. Um, 
with that view, then should should there be a need for briefings at all? Do you think? Um, I would think, in my over twenty years as town clerk and general manager of Mossman, unless there was a specific resolution of the council, I don't think there would have been a briefing. Uh, I just didn't agree with them. Yeah. Um, because of the problems that they can lead to. Uh, but if the council resolves, say the housing strategy, uh, they want to have a briefing. Uh, well, that's their entitlement. Uh, if they want to dig deeper and go on a bus and have an inspection and uh, the like, they should be able to. Uh, but um, it's got to be very, very carefully managed by the general manager or the, the representative to make sure there aren't decisions taken. Um, do, you, do you think, um, I want to speak generally about your experience, not necessarily at this organisation, um, but if you can tie it to here, then so be it. But uh, have you might be expressed that the use of briefings can be seen as a convenient way to kick an issue down the road when it should properly be resolved? Do you have a view about that? Uh, <laughs> I think it's pretty right. Um, and, you know, if there hadn't have been so many briefings on some of the issues here, they wouldn't have got kicked down the road. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mr Parrish. Um, I might come back to the Civic Centre issue now. And I think I've ascertained an answer from you, but just to ask you outright, um, did you think there was sufficient information and documentation of the decisions made and the operational aspects that were being dealt with in respect to the Civic Centre? No. Um, That's why I took an interest in it. Yes. Um, in your experience, in respect of a, an expenditure which was in the multiple millions of dollars and involved borrowing monies potentially for the project, would you have expected um, more documentation? A lot more. That was going to be my next question. Um, was there a significant lack of documentation oh, on the subject? In my view, yes. Uh, and I think that's confirmed, um, firstly, by Mr Finch, who looked at the funding of it. And uh, it's my summation. They got there, but it was a bit sneaky how they got there with, with allocating the money. Um, and the report of Mr Smith, I think it was, was commissioned by the general manager. Um, you know, he, he hit a brick wall too. Um, when you say that at least some of the money was acquired in a slightly sneaky way, are you referring there to the um, use of estimates which fell under certain caps to avoid... No, and maybe Same I should disease. withdraw the sneaky way. Well, uh, the, the, the way they were using revotes and allocations as you roll over, um, no. Um, I, I think that the undervaluing of um, the whole development to get around planning issues uh, and then misleading the office, office of local government, I can only describe as unprofessional and disgraceful. And is that a responsibility which lay at the governing, governing body's feet or the uh, senior staff's feet or both? The, the, senior, the senior staff, the executive staff, but the governing body has an oversight. There should have been many more questions asked. Um, it, it wasn't hard to look at the amount of money the council was talking about spending and then look at their application for a DA uh, to see that um, it didn't add up. And that DA process, um, given that they're the body who deals with DAs, um, was that DA process appropriately enacted? Uh, I, I can't answer that. All I can say is that since I've been here, the panel dealt with the executive area it had been finished before they dealt with it, or substantially finished before they dealt with it, because they weren't given the opportunity. Um, which, you know, look, I'm afraid it's just a, another issue in this place. 
Commissioner, I was going to move on from both the Finch report specifically and yes. from the 10 August yes. uh, report specifically and move on to Mr May's submissions yes, to just, the inquiry. Just bear with me a moment. Just on page 250 of the bundle, do you have that? <laughs> do you have page 250? Yes, sorry. Yes, the yeah. gong was signified. Um, there you refer to the New South Wales Ombudsman's report. Mm. Just in general terms, I appreciate it's dealt with in some way in this document, but can you just give me an overview of... of what that was and why you saw it as being a matter of such significance? Um, it, it related to developer contributions that had been... It's a while since I've looked at this. Yes. It related to development contributions that, which had been fixed some years ago for a development that happened more recently, and the council tried to... Well, they did. They increased the developer application to make it more current because they hadn't indexed it when they originally did it. I see. It was, it was, it was their fault. Yes. Um, the resident then paid, because there's really no option, uh, appealed to the council. The council uh, had a bit of a tin ear to the, the issue. Um, they then went to the ombudsman. My recollection is the ombudsman came in uh, and had an a initial view and looked at it and had undertakings from the council. Uh, but nothing happened, um, and then um, they went back to the ombudsman, and the ombudsman found that the council had failed in effect, and it was four or five recommendations. Yes. Um, the matter went to council, um, and the staff put up three options for the council, um, and I don't know whether this is true, but. Um, it's my summation. At the briefing, the staff would have said which one to vote for, and that happened. Um, and then the resident went to the Attorney General about it. The Attorney General then went to the Minister for Local Government. I arrive, and I get a letter from OLG drawing my attention to it. Um, I read the report in the morning. Um, I write my own reports. Um, I uh, moved a uh, motion of urgency and rescinded the council decision uh, in one minute. Uh, and then the next minute, uh, I adopted all the uh, ombudsman's um, recommendations. Uh, that happened within 48 hours of me getting a letter from OLG. And it wasn't because OLG and the, and the, um, the Attorney General had written it was to show the council staff and the community that there was new management. It was open and transparent, and there were new rules. Yes. Um, uh, if you turn to page 252, this is, I think, related to the, or at least informed in part, perhaps, by the um, intervention of various ministers, the attorney, the minister for finance, etc. And you say this about halfway down the page, in my view, Windsor Caribbean Shire Council took the position it was above the law and the resulting interventions of the minister for finance and small business to review the experiences of small businesses in the Shire and the attorney general to get action on behalf of residents as clear evidence. Can you just expand on that and tell well, me what you were intending to I was trying to, to show that in relation to the council chambers, I think it's clear they thought they were above the law. Um, then the small business commissioner's report that was instigated by the minister for finance yeah. and small business uh, because they were getting just getting nowhere uh, with the council. Um, and you probably read my views on, on all that. Um, 
and then uh, the Attorney General was the Ombudsman's yes. paper. Yes. So that was, I was just trying to, they just had a, I don't know, they, they saw themselves as above the law, in, in, in my view, and, you know, and, and, the, and the governing body by their behaviour yes. had, had no acknowledgement of the Local Government Act when it came to um, relationships. And um, so that's, I just want to emphasise that. Thank you. There. Yes, Mr Parrish. You've uh, observed meetings of the 2016-2020 Council. You've met with councillors and you've um, reviewed various documents and talked to members of the community. You might be in as good a position as anyone to give us your impression as to, A, whether some or all of the councillors did not appreciate their roles and responsibilities and obligations in the sense that they didn't understand them or whether they understood them and just chose from time to time to ignore them. Do you have an impression of that or too hard to say? No, I think it's a mixture of both. Uh, I, I had some difficulty um, because of record keeping and I know the staff tried hard uh, to get it, I had one go early and another go after the public inquiry was announced uh, to try and look at training uh, for councillors. Uh, but look, th this, this goes to the issue at the end of the day, uh, training of councillors. Um, and it's just the process at the, at the present time is just not appropriate, in my do, view. Do you mean that in respect of a structural Office of Local Government Level, or do you mean within this particular council, in your experience? Um, I, um, in, in, partic in particular councils, I, I think there's actually there's an obligation now um, yes. to you know, report to council on training. But look at Mossman, um, we used to report uh, 10 years ago when I was there who went and who didn't, uh, because it was important for the community to know. You know, nine times out of 10, it's those who should go who don't. Um, but, uh, you know, I've obviously read the, um, the report of the Central Coast uh, and uh, the Commissioner there deals with this matter, but I agree with her um, that so many people say that councillors are directors. Well, directors aren't selected in the ballot, through the ballot box uh, and they need a lot of help, I think. Um, you know, I've done the uh, director's course. Um, you know, I, I, I think the government's got to look at better training um, if they don't want to have, you know, more repeats of some of the councils I've been at. Do you think that should include um, some consistent base modules of basic competencies? Oh, definitely, yes. Um, which, whether at the induction stage or over the course of the term, should be reinforced through continuing professional development type training? Yes, and a good general manager does that. Uh, that they, they bring in trainers yes. to help. Um, and, you know, it, I've seen what the program here was, and there was a huge emphasis, emphasis on behaviour. Uh, not, not the core issues. Behaviour should be taken as accepted, as just the respect and, and, and just get on with it. Um, but there was a huge emphasis on that, which tells another story um, uh, to me. But being um, the, the fact that it was so heavily focused towards that, there was obviously a perceived need for repeated training on behaviour. Is that what you're driving well, at? Well, I, I, you know, respect is not hard. Um, and, you know, I, I come from a school where you don't need a lot of training on that. Uh, but the training on the complexities of the Local Government Act and what you can and you can't do, uh, I totally support the idea of OLG, uh, not LG New South Wales, who are the advocates for councillors, uh, but the local government department having fixed modules which are compulsory, yes. um, but you can't have a pass and fail because this is a democracy. Yes. Uh, but at least people would, um, uh, candidates and elected persons would have no excuse. Yes, and, that, and part of that, tell me if you agree with this, 
should go beyond merely recitation of sections of the Local Government Act at people, but be driven towards giving them an understanding of the nuances of local government. So, sorry, sorry, I'll, 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 that wasn't a very clear question. Um, effective training on roles and responsibilities, to my mind at least, must include something more than just reading sections of the Act oh. at people. It has to give them the ability to understand the nuances that arise in local government. Do you mm. agree with that? Yes. As well as the complexities of reading financial reports and engineering reports and planning matters and all those sorts of things. Do you agree with that? Yes, yes, definitely. And, you know, the, the Institute of Directors, you know, it, it's something like that, but I don't think it's, it's that. But, but they, they, they do examples uh, and, and little, little case studies where councillors or you know, participants can just go together. You're not a fool if you get it wrong, you just learn. Yes. Um, and I, I think that kind of training rather than death by PowerPoint. Um, yes. Yes, I understand. Thank you, Mr Parrish. Mr May, uh, one of the things I was going to do is um, only address issues in your submission that haven't been already covered in your two reports and the training and induction is one of the matters which you've just um, helped me with and taken out of my hands. But um, your reports were provided um, over a um, period of time, three months, and then your submission was on 28 October 2021 last year. Um, have there been any other events or experiences that you've had in the meantime which has changed your view on any matter that you've expressed an opinion on, either for good or for bad? It's only firmed up my view. Uh, since the general manager has been here um, and she's had the support of uh, very competent local government professionals, and I'm not saying that the people who filled in aren't, but they, they weren't at that level. Uh, so much has been uncovered. Um, you know, we, the council at the moment is getting belted up about development issues. Well, it's the legacy issues which were caused uh, by you know others, which are causing a lot of our trouble. And um, a lot of people have left the organisation because they're not happy with putting the customer or, or the, the the resident first. But, but acknowledging there's, there's rules and you've got to follow. Um, and the micro managing is disappearing, as I'm told. Um, and, you know, I think you know, I, I firmed up more that this place needs time. I can just when you now, say this place needs time, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is I can just imagine if there had been an election in December, I wouldn't have wanted to be the general manager. Uh, trying to address the issues in the organisation, operationally, and dealing with an incoming council. And what about looking forward to what's slated to be the elections in September of this year? Is the organisation better placed or is it still in need of time? Well, I've given this a, a, a lot of thought um, and I think the council needs more time. Um, and I say that um, there's really, um, I wrote myself down a little note about this because it's the longer the general manager is here and the longer you know I think about it, um, this council needed a circuit breaker. Uh, it's been going on for too long, it just went to new levels um, and it needed a circuit breaker. Um, the general manager has got to be afforded the time and the opportunity to do a good job. The government is spending a lot of money on this um, and it's an opportunity to get it right because it's been wrong for too long. The other thing I come to is um, fairness to candidates who are presenting for election. Um, a two year term, um, the councillors won't have worked out what they want as a community strategic plan. Um, there will still be a lot of issues outstanding um, and for those reasons, I think more time is, is, is required uh, to get the place, well, 
to get into a situation where the general manager has no excuses. And, I, and that's not being detrimental to the general manager. Yes. It could be any general manager. And from that to I understand, there's, there's two, two limbs to your view about that. One is the organisation is still rebuilding itself or reforming itself to correct some of the legacy issues and two, in order to give the incoming uh, governing body the greatest prospect of success in their role, they need a strong organisation with them, I suppose is the appropriate words. Is, have I understood the, the driving forces behind your views correctly? Uh, uh, correct. And, and, you know, I... I am confident from all the people I've spoken to, and there's been hundreds of them, uh, not just a handful, um, that this place replaced community with personality and we're working hard to put community back at the forefront. And, but that's going to take time. And as I said earlier, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't have liked to have been a general manager if had been an election in, in December, trying to cope with... I think there's going to be a huge turnover of councillors. Um, that's just my reaction. Um, and dealing with that and the complexities of rebuilding and resetting what was a broken organisation. Yes, thank you. Mr Parrish. That actually mops up one of the other um, last question I had arising out of the submission that hadn't been dealt with on your other reports. Um, I don't have any other specific topics to cover, Commissioner, unless... We'll move on. Um, I do want to put um, one matter to you. It's in the legal space we call it a brown and done question, which is uh, it's called a brown and done question, which is where I put a proposition to you. I'm not agreeing with it. I'm not asking you to agree with it, but it's a proposition that I'm going to put that I want your opinion on. Um, it's the view, um, at least of some councillors, it appears that you've adopted a course of conduct designed to undermine them, the suspended councillors. Um, do you want to react to that? This is your opportunity to disagree by, or agree with it? By, by their behaviour, they've undermined themselves in the eyes of the public. And, and, and if I could just go on from that, um, am I allowed to? Or? Yes. You, you, might, you might be preempting me to... Um, I was about to ask, is there any other topics that oh, you okay. want to no, There's just one issue. Which yes which I wanted to raise. Yes. But, uh, will I do that now? Or? Yes, that, that was a question. Yeah. It just right. relates to a, a, a press release that was issued the other day uh, by um, five of the councillors, which I absolutely find offensive. Uh, some of the, I, I've been very careful to not deal with the, with the person, but to deal with the, with the, the corporate and et cetera. But in that, it's reported that I've overseen the first deficit operating budget in 26 years and I just wonder when the truth is going to start and come out in writing from some of these people. This council has had five operating deficits in the last 10 years and, and the one we had last year um, of 707,000 was the smallest. Uh, there hadn't been any for, for three or four, or four years I think prior to this but um, it then goes on to say that there's yeah, you know, it all relates to payments for employees uh, when they're exiting the organisation. Well, a substantial amount went to the exiting of the former general manager, which the council organised to happen after the 1st of July last year. You know, when is this going to stop the misinformation um, and the mischief? And I, I just question whether there's any lessons being learnt. Yes. Um, Mr Parrish, I take it this is relevant to term of reference four? Uh, yes, it is, and um, I may just pick up um, that question in respect of term of reference three as well. And I'll just remind you of term of reference just three. Open it up. Um, that states um, whether members of council's governing body have been and will continue to be in a position to direct and control the affairs of council in accordance with the Local Government Act and to otherwise fulfil its statutory obligations. Um, the um, communications in the press, such as the one that you've just referred to there, um, 
do you have an opinion about whether, um, firstly, there is a recognition that, um, based on your conclusions, they have not fulfilled their roles and responsibilities? And secondly, uh, do you have an opinion as to whether this sort of conduct suggests that they will be able to fulfil their roles and responsibilities if they are returned? This kind of conduct proves to me that this committee needs a circuit breaker. Um, I, um, uh, is it possible for me to table a, 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 a response I've Do had from the staff oh. about this? Yeah, but Mr Parrish, perhaps um, if I take five minutes, then Mr May can provide you what he wants and yes. then you can wrap up this topic Thank in you. an orderly way. Is that yes. suitable? That'd be useful. Yes, I'll adjourn until quarter to two.
Yes, Mr. Parrish, you ready? Yes, Commissioner. Um, can I start with the document that I've provided to you, Mr. May, that says Kumangi got us? Is that the uh, report in the paper that you were talking about just before we had a short break? Yes, but I don't know because I haven't read the Kumanji Got Us article. I've only read the press release. Yes. Which I think, I, so I don't know if it's word for word. I'll, I'll, I'll bring that to you now. Um, there's a press release in the bundle of documents that you've taken us to in the very last document. Yes. Is a um, press release. Is that right? Yes. And that's the uh, document you were talking about before the break. Correct. Um, what I'll do, Commissioner, is I'll tender the actual um, article from the uh, Southern Highlands Express first, and then I'll take Mr May through each of the documents in his bundle. Um, yes, all right. Um, the article from the Southern Highlands Express of... Uh, 30 May, I think. 30 it is. March. 30 March, pardon me. 30 March 2022. Headline Kumunji, C O O M U N G I E, got us. Gare's gang allege political stitch up will be exhibit. Sorry about that. Uh, in. Thank you. Thank you. Now, just turning to the bundle of the documents you've provided us, uh, is the first document an email from Damien Jenkins uh, to the interim administrator, I assume you, uh, with various people copied in, dated April 4, 2022, at 7.14.52 pm? Yes. And uh, just at this stage, to foreshadow, Commissioner, that's a document which shows the uh, operating surplus or deficits over the last uh, 10 years, which I'll make submissions on in the due course and may obtain a summons for the raw data which sits behind it. But it shows operating deficits in 2011-12 uh, of 8 million roughly 2012-13 of 4 million roughly, 2013-14 6 million roughly, 2014-15 4 million roughly, and then some small surpluses, and then the $707,000 um, yes. deficit. Um, Mr May, you may or may not be able to answer this, but these numbers, they would be in the annual reports of each year? Yes. Yes, yes. thank you. Um, and the next document is part of that email. Do you see that? The next document over is part of that email. Yes. Uh, the de next document there is a... Um, well, you won't have to explain to me what the next document is there. Is that just the third page of the email, the little... Um, yeah, yes, it looks like something's gone wrong with the, the printing. Yeah, yep. it, it, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. It, it, it just shows up. The, uh, as I said earlier, we had a workshop yesterday afternoon, um, and I don't get to talk to the staff very often, and I got to talk to this officer, um, and I said to him, I just can't understand where some of this stuff comes from, um, particularly next year's uh, statement that there'll be, a, or this year, we'll, we'll finish up $800,000 in the red. Uh, and I said, have I missed something? And no, uh, you haven't. And then I, I brought a context to it. And then I get an email um, last night. And I just, um, I, I don't want to get Damien Jenkins into any trouble uh, about all of this. I don't want him to become a target because um, he's a young fellow who's very, very good in my view. Uh, but 
he's offered this to me, and I would think in response to this article, and that, that shows to me, through the organisation, that they've had enough too. Um, so that, the, 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 the next attachment relates, they're trying to uh, show me how, how these councillors have got confused, suggesting there's an 800,000, that they were, in effect, um, the, 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 it's all very complex of finances, but the, the council overextends itself um, and there's massive revotes. And the general manager, as part of what she's been doing, has been addressing all of these issues. It's, she's, it's a massive job that she's undertaking. Um, and there's a number of matters have been deferred, and, and, and I think they think this is where this could be coming from. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next document along there is the article we've just been talking about. Yes. That's correct? Yes. Um, this embargo until 6 yes. a.m. Wednesday. Yeah, I'll, I'll still tender that as part of this bundle, Commissioner. And then lastly, um, in this bundle is a um, press release headed sacking was political, say, councillors. Uh, embargo till 6 a.m. Wednesday, March 30, 2022. Is that right? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner, I'll tender that bundle of, tender that bundle of documents. Yes, um, bundle of documents. Handed through Mr May will be Exhibit O. Mr May, is there any concern about the confidentiality of any of this financial no, not, information? Not with me. It's just that I would hate to think that there is... This is about the first time a council officer's name's come out, so perhaps that should have been... Redacted. We can redact yes. the personal information. Yes. All right. Well, it's been mentioned. Not yeah, much I can do about that now, yeah. but I understand the concern. And Mr. Parrish, there's no reason, is there, for that, for the officers' names to be identified in the no. public version of the exhibit? Is there? No. Yes. Thank you. And may I just say for the transcript? The email appears largely to be factually based with information surrounding it rather than any opinion given. Yes, quite. Yes, Mr Parrish. I have no further questions of Mr May. Yes, all right. Um, are there any applications? with me a moment. Yes, what's what are the topics or topic what's the, are there more than one topics? Yes, Commissioner. What's the first one? The first one is the reference by Mr May to developers uh, ending up with a pot of gold and leaving the problems with the my words uh, with the uh, council in relation to um, up Upzoning. Which of my terms of reference does that go to? Um, well, it's, it would be number four again, sir, because it relates to general comments about planning. That's not what term of reference four is directed to. What what particular issue arising out of Mr May's observation does I, I, fall within term of reference four? I would like to just seek, seek clarification of what uh, the size of that those problems were that were left behind. It was in, uh, Mr May also spoke about the uh, um, southern um, by bypass along Old South Road as being capable of being funded um, historically, but it wasn't. So I just want to ask about that. that that's the first one. Yes, what, what are the other topics? Uh, the second one is the to just confirm who were the five councillors that issued that media release that's been tabled. I think it's obvious. It's in the article that's in the exhibit. It, does it include a, 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 a councillor who's retired, is what I wanted to read you can, into the record. You can see the public exhibit. Yes, thank you. Okay. And I'd like to ask Mr May, when he was looking at, records of training with staff, um, did he find much record of the training? He, 
Yes. Well, perhaps ask that question first. Mr May, um, when you were examining council's records in relation to training for councillors, could you outline exactly what you found there or the staff found with you? Was, was it very complete? In, in relation to the information available, I thought it was very scant. And there was, from recollection, no record of who attended. But uh, as I understand it, that information has been made available to the Commission the inquiry. Thank you. Yes, next question. Mr May, uh, you mentioned staff concerns of certain councillors returning and how they might be fear and how they might be um, treated. Could you please name those councillors? Well, you didn't foreshadow that question, that topic. No, I didn't. I'm sorry. No. Well, uh, when I ask you about topics, yep. that's for a reason. Um, so you want to know whether the staff have identified whether particular councillors are the cause of that concern. Is that right? Yes. Um, that's that's a question of far too general a scope to be yes. properly answered in my submission. Um, I think Mr May, I may be able to shortcut this, I think Mr May you indicated in your evidence that you in fact didn't engage with staff about who was who when comments like that were being made. Did I understand that correctly? That is correct. Yes. Yes, next question. Mr May, you mentioned open and transparent on a number of occasions and uh, you, um, would you like to comment on Station Street in reference to that? Well, you didn't flag this topic either. Uh, no, sir, I, I didn't. Um, it was my notes are very higgly piggly. All right. Well, Mr. take Mr. a May. moment. Take a moment to review your notes, and I want leave is not granted generally to ask questions, as you'll be no, aware. Okay. I need I need you to explain the topics to me, and then okay. we'll deal with them in issue. So, if you need a moment. I'm more than happy to give no, it to I've you. No, I've highlighted them here, um, All right. Commissioner. So um, you want to ask... a question about open and transparency, um, and also um, I'd like to just drill into the um, executive and council officers' comments. Right. So what about Station Street, do you want to ask Mr May? Um, Mr May, um, you released the, I believe, the complete records on Station Street as one of your first acts of interim administrator here. Um, is that because you believed we should be more open and transparent? Commissioner, he answered that question. Mr May answered his... gave his um, views on the transparency and the yes. information provided in respect of Station Street. Yes, um, I think he has, but if you can answer the question, you can answer it again. I released everything I have or what the council had, because I thought it was in the public interest, so to do. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Is there any matters in in a council such as this that you think should not be released generally? I know you're going to say staff matters, they're legal matters, they're confidential. Well, no, no. Okay, I'll just answer, ask the question ask the and let question. the witness answer. Are, are there any matters in, in council you don't believe should be open and transparent? Well, and I'll reject that question. That's not a fair question. Okay. Mr May, are there any matters that a council would deal with in its ordinary business that are appropriately kept confidential? Of course. Yes. Uh, headline categories, what, what sort of matters do you have in mind? Uh, staffing matters. Yes. Uh, commercial and confidence uh, tenders. Um, could be property acquisitions. Um, could be the lead up to developer agreements on... Um, on uh, opening of, of, of new estates, yes. but provided they follow the guidelines. Uh, there's a, a whole host which just depend. Uh, and indeed uh, the Act makes provision for those cases. The Act is very clear. Yes, thank you. Yes, next question. 
that, that's all. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, now, Mr. Mayor. There was a topic you foreshadowed as your first topic. Have you abandoned that topic, or do you wish to put a question in relation to it? No, I think I think sufficient now. Okay, thank, thank you, Commissioner. Thank, thank you, you Mr. 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 Parrish. Anything arising? No, Commissioner. Mr. May, that completes your evidence. Thank you very much for your attendance this morning. I know we've been sitting quite a long session, uh, so I appreciate you bearing with us. Mr. Parrish, is there any prospect that Mr. May may need to be recalled at some later stage? Not at this stage, Commissioner. Do you want to reserve your position on that? Yeah, of course. Yes. All right, Mr. May, I won't formally excuse you from your summons just yet in case there's some small prospect that Mr. Parrish might need to ask you some more questions. I don't think that'll arise at the moment, but um, if it does, he'll be in contact with you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Mr Parrish, is there anything else I need to do today? Not today, Commissioner. We have no further witnesses. Today. All right. And in terms of witnesses for tomorrow, is they still a work in progress? That is, it appears that we may have Ian Reynolds first thing in the morning. But, yes. Um, it is a slight work in progress. We have to do some shuffling at the moment. Yes. All right. Um, all right, well, if, a, if an updated list can be put up on the website sometime today, but at the moment, for those who are interested, we anticipate Mr Reynolds being the first witness and um, we'll keep everybody updated as we can, but it's not simply a matter of moving pieces uh, around a table. There's a lot that goes into it, so that work will be being done in the background. All right, I'll um, adjourn until 10am tomorrow. Thank you.